everyone, and welcome to Twitch Tales, episode 92, or season 6, episode 3. Assembling the team. Where did we leave off in the last episode? Apis has arrived in Fonderg, the most northerly, well-established city of the northwest Corinthian Island. You have arrived back from your excursion to the Feywild and then your brief uh, brief side quests over in the Drenvale Forest with Seed and Spear and Julius the Unicorn. And you have stepped through the Myconid teleportation to the Deadwoods with the Termites uh, and then south from there to Fonderg. You, uh, you made your way back to Fonderg where you discovered that it has been about eight and a half months since you were here. Because of the time dilation of the Feywild, it has been a lot longer than you feel like it has been. For you, it has only been about a month or so, uh, but for the rest of the people of Fonderg, a lot of time has passed, including the starting of a major war. So Fonderg is supplying the frontier town slightly to the north of here, uh, the frontier town called Shadridge, with the supplies and military uh, military units needed to uh, to drive back the demons from the Great Expanse, a huge swath of forest to the north of there. And so we're in the middle of a demon war. And you spent last episode uh, at a meeting with uh, the, the lieutenant that is in charge of Fonderg. Um, I retconned in the time between last episode and this episode uh, because I realized that Corporal wouldn't really make sense for someone of his position, um, given the rankings that I've decided for my world and how they work. Uh, it goes Private, Corporal, Sergeant, Lieutenant, and then more above that. So I decided uh, Corporal Gellaby is getting a retconned uh, a promotion up to Lieutenant Gellaby. So you spent, a you spent time in the meeting with Gellaby, uh, the town mayor and the head of the various different guilds of Fonderg, discussing and catching up on what has happened. You also used your demon sensing abilities as a Horizon Walker Ranger to sense that in the room with you, somebody was a demon. Somebody at this meeting. You thankfully were able to ascertain that it was not actually any of the people sitting at the table as the as the uh, the, the people, the, the heads of the various guilds of Fondog. In fact, it was an invisible closet had uh, in a, as a spy uh, up in the corner of the room, sitting invisibly and watching. Who knows how long the spies of, of the Quasits have been um, uh, spying on the people of Fonderg and their plans, but you managed to ice him, <laughs> kill the Quasit, and then ascertain that there was no others in the room with you. However, it does make Fonderg now aware of the fact that uh, invisible, uh, invisible demons are a problem. After the meeting, you went for a private dinner with the head of the Arcanists Entente, a wizard's guild here in Fonderg, uh, and you, you spoke with Vala uh, about all that had happened, sort of catching up with her on a more personal level. Uh, what else did you ask Vala about? I don't really remember. It wasn't important. Basically, uh, Vala was enchanting some braces for you uh, to be better uh, armor for you, but also to have a once per day use of uh, the sending spell. And in the time that you have not been here, she finished enchanting those braces and gave them to you. Only it turns out you weren't you. You were a changeling that was posing as you. You don't know whether for malicious reasons or not, uh, but you... you no longer have those uh, th those um, those braces, I suppose. During the dinner with Vala, you also discussed with her the fact that you are partially mushroom now. Apis, you are a dwarg, which is my homebrewed version of a dwarf. Um, uh, you're a, a, a ground dwarg, um, but more recently you have changed your DNA slightly by undergoing some sort of mushroomy ritual with some myconids. Uh, in order to fix your memory, and fix your memory it did, but at the cost of making you part mushroom myconid now. Uh, this comes with the downfall of being poisoned by sun, so if you are out in the sun for too long you get poisoned condition, 
uh, and if you are if you are disconnected from the earth for too long you start to feel anxious and uh, and sick it does come with the, with the benefit of a regenerative nature you can cut yourself and regenerate um, relatively quickly but some some of apis's neurons decide that the um, the benefits do not outweigh the detriments and would like the the mushroomness reversed or removed uh, so you spoke with Vala about the ways to do that and she let you know of a couple of different options. That's about where we picked up, uh, where we left off, so uh, let's jump into it with episode 92 of Twitch Tales. Apis, you are finishing your dinner with Vala. Do you feel like dessert? Also, are you going to be picking up the bill? Yes to dessert and yes to picking up the bill. We told Vala that it was on us. All right. So let's get some dessert. What do you guys think is a, an appropriate dessert to have at this uh, this this restaurant? The restaurant you're at is called uh, Peak Dining, I think it was, and it's uh, it's a mountain-based restaurant that serves uh, mountain foods. So often it's serving uh, for the mains. Obviously, it's serving mountain goat and such, um, a couple of like mountain stream fish. Um, let's see, a fruit crumble of some kind. Yeah, I like that. A fruit crumble, yeah. You get a, uh, a fruit crumble. Um, uh, Vala gets a sticky toffee pudding. Uh, and and is there anything in particular you want to discuss over dessert with um, with with Vala? Uh, the last thing to happen right before uh, right before ordering dessert was that you had Vala send a message to the person who took your braces, saying, "Hey, turns out you're not the real Apis. Give the give the braces back." Uh, and they responded with. Ha ha ha, they're mine now, essentially. Because they're Fey, and Fey are tricksy bullshit. Uh, tricksy bullshit artists. And so the uh, so the the Fey that took your braces was you. They were like, the braces were gifted to me, so therefore they're mine. Because that's how Fey things like to, uh, to operate. Uh, so you don't know where it is or what it's doing with your braces, but it's it's refusing to give them back. And that's where we ended off. Are we giving her the cyclopede bits? Uh, not here at dinner, you're not. She did say that if she wanted, uh, if you wanted to drop off any um, any of the uh, gross animal parts that you've been picking up along the way, the monster parts and things, uh, you're welcome to come to her office and do so in a more official manner. She's not going to carry around monster parts with her uh, from dinner. Could we demand an exchange of the braces for something else because the Fey are all about deals? That is a definite possibility. Right now, no, because you're not with the Fey. Uh, you had Vala send a message to them, and they said... <laughs> through message form. Have we happened to mention yet that the whole reason we left was to visit an Archfey to learn about closing portals, and that's why we're gone, gone for so long, and the entire timey-wimey way it works? You did mention about the timey-wimey way it works, I think, through the general hand wavy exposition you would have mentioned about the the archfey and the closing of portals and things which is why lieutenant gellaby asked you to put together a small a small crack team essentially a swat team and head north to try and close the demon portal that's your current major quest you can do side quests of course on the way you can do what you want you can even just ignore that quest go off and do something completely different but currently, your main goal under the journal tab of your of your diary is um, is to put together a very small team of people, very uh, adept fighters or you know sneakies, sneaky sneakies or whatever. Put together a small team of people and head north into the Great Expanse, try and find where the portal is, where all the demons are coming from, and close it without dying. Ask for Vala's advice on who we should take. Vala, um, I was wondering if you had any way in on who would be uh, uh, who would be useful in a team like this, because it's a tricky one. Because obviously the ideal people to take are the most powerful people of Fondog, but the most powerful people of Fondog are needed in Fondog. I would say it depends on what you want. If you want somebody who is adept with the land, then Polython is too valuable for us here, but Charlie uh, is her second in command, uh, for want of a better word. Charlie would probably be be, be on the verge of expendable uh, here in Fondurg, and he would be powerful enough to be useful. 
Likewise, myself, if you want an arcanist or someone uh, well studied in the arcane arts, I am invaluable to Fondurg at this point, but uh, some of the the people below me at the Arcani uh, Arcanist Entente could be useful. If you want a someone who is adept at fighting, then I would recommend one of the uh, one of the higher ranking Knights of Kavosna. She's not going to make the decision for you, but she does. She do, she does um, she does recommend. If you say, is there a chance that Joey and Charlie would be a good fit? She nods and approves and says, Joey is a very adept fighter, and Charlie is a very adept druid. Can we note that we ask about the mission without stating explicitly about the mission because we didn't sweep for invisible eavesdroppers? Um, you can, yeah, you can, you can very quietly. Uh, discuss the rest of what you're discussing, knowing the possibility that there are invisible creatures eavesdropping. I had thoughts about Charlie and Joey. If I find anyone better suited, they can come back from Shadridge with a report. Yes, very smart. Um, I would recommend you approach their respective uh, factions and request their leave of absence. Um, they would be powerful enough to survive, I'm sure given that you don't get into any stupid situations. <laughs> Since it's dangerous, I know there are risks. Um, I'm wondering if there's anyone perhaps powerful but more expendable, like the Fiend. I don't know that she knows who the Fiend is. She says, uh, I don't, who are you referring to, sorry? I know you're trying to be coy here in case of eavesdroppers, but you see, the fiend. It's like I, I don't know who you're referencing. He's a, he's a, a, a hobbit fella that runs a thieves guild in town. Oh, I, I wouldn't know anything about that. I, I, I don't have any. I don't have any um, connections to uh, thieves guilds in town. And she looks questioning you as if to say like, why do you? We got we got robbed once. Uh, yeah, the 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 got robbed and taken to his hideout, and we got introduced in that way. We're not supposed to mention him out, or he'll come after us. We have already enough trouble on our tail. Uh. <laughs> um, are there any healing mages around? Any clerics or anything? And she says, "I'm afraid not. The um, the healers of Fondurg are." They're powerful, obviously. Healing in any in any form is powerful, but they're not at the level you would need them for for a mission like this. Uh, besides, Fondo cannot spare any healers. There are there are people of a town of this size uh, getting into accidents, regardless of being at war. Uh, couple that with the in increase in uh, in the smithies and the um, the smelters, the mining, and such, and it leads to a um, a rather disastrous uh, rate of injury happening day to day. Unfortunately, the healers are much too valuable here. At this point, the uh, the, the you finished your your desserts, and the uh, the bill comes. Uh, what sort of uh, what sort of pricing is it here at the dine at the peak dining? It's nice. It's a nice dining. It's uh, it's, it's it's not cheap stuff, but it's also not going to break the bank. I'm going to say it's going to cost you. Let's make sense of this. Um, I think for everything, all all told, uh, let's say a gold piece. So you mark off the gold piece for every uh, for all of the dinner. Uh, let's go into your inventory app here and mark off one gold. Ask if she has any ideas for mitigation of sunsickness. About the, um, as you're sort of getting your stuff together and leaving the peak dining to walk back down towards town, the sun's well and truly set now. It's um, it's well into the night. You can see that there's oil lamps being lit around town. There's a little, um, uh, uh, what do they call that guy? The guy that runs around lighting all the oil lamps. I'm sure there's a name for that job that I can't remember right now. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Uh, two hundred dollars. Uh, not exactly, Dennis. I've uh, more recently adapted things in my mind to be a hundred dollars per gold because it's in much easier, much easier calculations for myself. So it's about a hundred dollars for uh, for the whole meal. Um, 
Uh, da, 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 da. What's 161 PP? PP is platinum pieces, and it's uh, it's money that you have stashed up in a uh, a, a secret hole in the woods um, up in the north somewhere. Lamplighter, that's what they're called. The lamplighter. What's the name of that guy who lights lamps? Um, Dumbledore. <laughs> click, click, click. I get that reference. Um, do, 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 do. What were we saying? Oh yes, you you bring up the. Uh, the uh you bring up the uh the sun sickness and say is there any way is there any way you can think of of combating that and she says well of course my mind goes immediately to that of magic and uh spells that can reduce the light levels of a of an area such as darkness um a very simple spell but it would leave you blind as well um of course as a dwarf you can you can uh, sense the the land that you're walking on correct you like i do have tremor sense yes so tremor sense as a dwarf is something that I've given uh, given you guys as a um, as a homebrewed thing with my dwarfs. My dwarfs have uh, have tremor sense. If you're connected to unworked stone or ground or earth, uh, you can you can get a sense of uh, the area around you and anything that is connected to that ground as well. So you could walk around um, blinded by darkness. Uh, the sun wouldn't be able to get to you, but also you'd be relying on your tremor sense. So anything flying or whatever would not uh, would be able to sneak up on you. Besides, you don't know how to cast darkness. We don't want to be a dark blob moving around the land. I was thinking, um, like mud. <laughs> and she goes, I, I'm afraid I'm not well versed in uh, mycology. Uh, I don't know a lot about mushrooms and how they work, and I'm not sure. I can't say for sure whether mud would work. I, I, I would. I think it's a very cheap and easy substitute for magic. I would certainly try it, and if it works, it works. Is there a mask shop in town? Um, mask shop, let's see. A town of Fondurg size. There probably would be some kind of dress up shop that would that would potentially have masks. There wouldn't be a, a, a shop dedicated to masks. Uh, but there would be a there'd be some kind of a um, a costume shop or like a kid's pa like a party shop or something that might have masks. Earthbending seismic sense. That's awesome. Yeah. What about a parasol? What about a, a parasol? Maybe for the. She says it might work. Uh, they're all they're all ideas that would be worth uh, attempting. Apis. Uh, I can't tell you for sure which of these would or would not work. I'm afraid. Uh, this is my turn. Um, you have somewhere to stay tonight. And you say. Yes. Where are you guys intending on staying while you're in Fondurg? There is the old tavern that you stayed at before, the inn rather, uh, the um, Tattered Page, which is a tavern come in, come library. Do we still have the bone mask? Uh, you do not still have the bone mask, no. I don't believe you do anyway, it's not in your inventory and so you've lost it along the way if you, if you did. Transform the cloak of many fashions to give good coverage. You could do that. You could definitely transform the cloak of many fashions to be a big, thick, uh, thick cloak. It is winter as well, so having a nice, big, thick cloak would work. Where did um, where did the fake version of me stay while they were pretending to be me? Um, and Valis says, well, as as I didn't get to know them too well uh, they stayed all over the place sometimes they stayed at an inn here in town and other times they uh, stayed outside outside of Fondo for a great deal of the last few months you she puts in inverted commas you were up in Shadridge or up on the war front um, you haven't been just hanging out here in Fondo for eight months you would come and go from time to time sometimes with weeks between um, but the times that you were here, you generally camped outside or or stayed at one of the inn. All right. So, uh, what would you? Where would you like to stay? You're gonna camp because you need to be connected to the ground for um, for the sake of your mushroom anxiety situation. You want to camp out on the ground. It is winter, so uh, I will. If you are camping out in the ground and you don't have any sort of thick winter clothing or anything, then uh, that will be a problem. You do actually have uh, over here. Look in your, in your inventory. Uh, over here, doo -doo 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 -doo. you have some uh, you have some cloaks that is uh, winter clothing essentially. Uh, can we um, 
Can we have a meeting tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning to get the supplies organized, the supplies that I'm going to need for this trip, and uh, ask Joey and Charlie if they consent. I'd like to swap my sword for a rapier if possible, holy water, etc, etc. She says, uh, yes, I can, um, I can attend a meeting, where would you, where would you like it to be? You want to sleep at the Tattered Page, because then that's also a library, it's also a source of potentially doing some more research into whatever you want to research. We can go check in Umbria, south of the town, yep. We let them know that we care and we're willing to listen if they want to talk about it, but let them, let them put the ball in their court, that's smart, yep. We would know if the greenhouse has a dirt floor. The greenhouse does not have a dirt floor, it has a tile floor, but it is out in the uh, in the wilderness south of town, so you can easily just sleep outside of the greenhouse in your tent or whatever. I, you don't have a tent per se, but you do have bedroll and stuff. You're familiar with sleeping out in the in the in the woods. I will tell you that Apis, as a ranger and an outlander, has been on the land, living on the land for long enough to know that sleeping out outside without a tent without uh, any overhead protection as it were uh, in the middle of winter will require a constitution saving throw from you to get a full night's rest and not wake up with a level of exhaustion <clears throat> we could check in with briar we were wanting a more private chat with them yep yeah. all right so there's a few uh there's a few options coming up and down here Uh, why a rapier? I think I think some of Apis's neurons want a rapier rather than a sword because uh, a sword uses the strength modifier and a rapier uses your dexterity modifier. And as you can see in the corner here, uh, strength is a plus one and dex is a plus three. So a rapier would be a uh, a, a finesse weapon that would be easier for uh, for rap uh, for Apis to wield. Happy with the tattered page or the greenhouse? All right. Okay, let's put this to a poll then, because it seems like there's uh, there's some options coming about. So poll. Uh, we'll go where to head for bed. Where to head for bed? We have the tattered page. The tattered page is an inn that you have stayed at before. It is a library come in. Uh, we have a we have uh, just camping uh, out in the wilderness. Uh, we have the greenhouses south of uh, Fonderg, which is doubles as the headquarters of the PEA, meaning that in the morning you'll be able to talk to Charlie and uh, Briar and all the rest of them. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it, or some other. I'll just put other as an option as well for anyone who wants something else. All right, so with 52% of Apis's mind wanting to head to the greenhouse south of Fonderg, you decide that's where you're heading. So you bid Vala good day, um, good evening, and you start heading south. It doesn't take you too long to reach the edge, southern edge of uh, Fonderg city, and uh, you see the, the town guards are on duty there uh, on the gate. They strongly recommend against going outside after dark at this point, uh, but they also recognize you as Apis, the one of the uh, one of the local legends that helped to take down Lucifreak and uh, has done several uh, several important and um, and dangerous missions for the town of Fonderg in the last eight months. And so ultimately they bow to your discretion and they say, okay, well, on your head be it. Um, be very aware that there are, there is, you know, things are dangerous at night time out in the wild. Uh, and so you, <clears throat> they let you out of the uh, town gates and you head south a little bit further. Can we pass, uh, cast Pass Without Trace before leaving? You can if you want, yes. Thumbs up, thumbs down if you want to cast Pass Without Trace before you leave. So uh, you have, let me op open up your character sheet here. You have, as you can see on your spells, uh, pass without trace there as a second level spell, and you have two spec second level spell slots left. All right, so <laughs> you cast pass without a trace. Um, you before as the as you're just on the outside of the city gates, they close the doors behind you. You can feel heal them being bad and such. There's a few uh, torches on the uh, like um, not sconces. What are they called? Uh, what are those big standing torches called that they plant into the ground uh, to light to light up either side of a path, um, like a tiki torch kind of thing? 
you uh, you see the tiki torches are, uh, uh, are leading lighting the way um, outside of the south of the town so that they can see if anything comes within a hundred feet of the the, uh, the walls. So out here, there's lots of flickering shadows cast by these torch lights, uh, and so you 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 focus in on the sh flickering shadows, and you draw them towards yourself with your breath. And eventually, after drawing them in one or two times, you manage to get them all the way to you, and you encompass your body by shadows, uh, paying homage to the the god of of deception that gave you this uh, this ability. Uh, Garmison, I think his name was. And as you pass without trace, you head south. I'll have you roll a stealth check. And there we go. Uh, da -da -da -da, dice cam. Here we go. Uh, that is a 12 for you. 12 plus your stealth, which is... Uh, you are proficient in stealth, which at this level is a plus 3. So you've got 3 from dex, 3 from stealth, that's 6. Plus 10 from pass without trace, that's 16. 16 plus 12, that's a 28 stealth check. With 28 stealth, you uh, you are very well shrouded um, as you walk away from the town. Um, if you were perceptive enough, you might even hear the guards uh, starting to freak out a little bit that maybe you weren't real. <laughs> because from their perspective, you just walked out of the gates and then kind of just disappeared into shadow and, and didn't even seem to walk away. They didn't, they didn't see where you went. Uh, so you head south until you get to the greenhouses. You are not accosted on the way, of course. Uh, and you uh, you arrive unaccosted at the greenhouses. Uh, the greenhouses at this time of night are shut up. The, if people are inside, then you can't see them. Uh, and if people are inside, they're probably asleep anyway. So what do you want to do? You know that a little bit further south of here, uh, you know where Briar lives, but turning up at her house unannounced after dark in the midst of a demon war is maybe not the smartest idea. She might not even be there. Can we knock? You can knock. You go up to the greenhouse door and knock on the glass. Dush, 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 dush. Uh, I'm going to see. Percentile check. Let's see who, if anybody, is around in the greenhouse this late at night. Oh, lucky. Okay, uh, yes, it seems like there is very little uh, time uh, between you knocking and you seeing the back. You can obviously see through the, uh, the glass of the greenhouse into the greenhouse itself at this point. You look inside, and uh, being dark outside and um, slightly more illuminated inside, uh, you can see that there is nobody in the main body of the greenhouse. However, Polython's door at the back uh, of the back of the greenhouse, um, closed off to the uh, to the rest of the greenhouse, um, that opens up, and you see Charlie walk out. Charlie, for those who don't remember or are new, is a, a... I think he's Britain or is he Full Elf? I can't remember, actually. Let me look it up. Charlie is a Britain, yes. He's, he's in his 50s. A Britain in my world is the... Uh, <laughs> B-R-I-D-A-N is how it's spelled. Uh, he is a half-elf, half-human, which in my world is called uh, uh, known as Britons. Uh, he's very confident uh, moon druid, very good at... Uh, transforming into animals. He sort of specializes in his shape-shifting abilities and uh, uh, and he's pretty high ranking in the uh, Knights of Gravosna. You were uh, captured with him, uh, sorry, in the um, uh, Penkampura Namgulshed. You were captured along with him during the arc of the campaign uh, where the, the Green Dragon was a problem here in Fondurg um, and he was very very uh, integral to the escape uh, escape plan and so you're you've gotten on pretty well with Charlie you see him walk out of the uh, the back room and head across the tiled floors of the uh, uh, the, the interior of the greenhouse uh, you also see Polython the uh, the female uh, well the gender fluid wood elf um, uh, who is in charge of the Penkampura and Amgulshed, uh, come out of the back room as well and kind of like just be on the watch, being like, hmm, who's who's knocking on the greenhouse at this time of night? So it seems like Charlie and Polython were having some sort of a uh, late night meeting, um, discussing whatever they were discussing in her back room. Then uh, he walks to the front door, opens the uh, the latches on the, the interior of the, uh, the glass door. It's not 
very well secured because most people won't want to break into a, a greenhouse and if they wanted to they could just smash the windows so it's not majorly barred or locked or whatever so he just unlocks the door opens it up for you and says um apis is it what do you say nice roof you point at the uh, the roof of the greenhouse which is completely fixed up seems like it probably has been for months there's a lot of bird poop on it. it. Needs cleaning off. Do you happen to have a spare flower bed? Could do with a place to sleep. What was um? Hmm. And he thinks he goes. I was going to ask you something that only Apis would know, but it seems like the fake Apis knew things that only Apis would know as well. So um, it's not very a useful way of doing it, is it? What if I just stab you? Do you bleed blood? And I think the last guy bled blood as well. Um, well, I'm just going to assume you're right. <laughs> and he steps to the side, just being like, "Eh, if you're a demon, you could have been. A, you could have been the same. You could have been a demon for the last eight months, and you never attacked me. So, like, even if you are, if, even if you are the fake guy, like, uh, it's, I'm, it's too late in the night to care. Essentially, he just like, eh, <laughs> he just steps aside and lets you into the greenhouse. Um, I'm looking for a safe place to sleep close to nature. Um, figured I'd give the greenhouse a try. You don't mind, I hope. Uh, you explain very briefly about the whole mushroom situation, and Parthen says, "Yes, I was. Uh, I was informed that you were um, part mushroom. Now, I suppose. Uh, let's um, let's find you a place that you can sleep. I suppose uh, how, how unorthodox to actually use a flower bed as an actual bed." Um, and she starts to use her druid craft to just gently, gently require uh, request from the plants that they that they make a little room. Um, you can tell that she's like casting speak with plants as well to just like tell them, "Hey, here's what the situation is. I need you to get out of the way a second. I, I've got, I need some, I need somewhere for my uh, my friend to to sleep." I've been trying to figure out how they knew so much about me as well. Yes, um, you've been the you've been the talk of of uh, of the town for some time now. Uh, you were rather useful in the war, and then all of a sudden disappeared, and then. When you turn up, everybody, everybody learns that the person that they thought they knew was not the person they thought they knew. But they certainly knew a lot about you. Who knows how the Fae work, right? I'm now more of a fun guy. <laughs> you take a ten points of psychic damage. We should try asking the plants to do that with our Mykonid plant talking thingy. Yeah, you um you can do your uh, uh, at will sort of check in with any plants around. You can kind of feel how they the plants feel, and they are um, they are feeling very comfortable, very well looked after, very healthy, uh, and more to the point, more recently, very accommodating. Um, it seems like they are more than willing enough, more than willing to allow uh, a fellow plant to uh, to come and sit with them. And I know that mushrooms aren't plants, but in D and D, myconids are considered the plant subtype. Yes, with your plant emotion thing, you uh, you 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 determine that the plants are more than happy having you sleeping among them on their flower bed. So uh, you head in. Um, they you catch them up on what happened in the meeting earlier today, and uh, and the fact that you've been asked to assemble a team. You tell them that you're looking to have a meeting in the morning to discuss, like, uh, the acquisition of the uh, materials needed. I love the mushroom powers, but the downside's really ugly. Yep. Let the PEA that the plants are liking the mush the the plant the uh, the greenhouse, and that sparks an interest from Polython. And she says, "This mushroom, this mushroom thing comes with um, abilities to determine plant emotions, does it?" It's a, it does. Uh, hasn't been super useful, but when it has been useful, it's been really useful. <laughs> Thinking back to the time that you connected to a very, very, very ancient, powerful god tree uh, using this ability. You tapped into uh, who she was and then rolled a nat 20 on a religion check and suddenly I, I was giving you exposition that I had no intention of giving you. So it has been useful, but it's extremely niche.
Mel, Mel, yeah, as soon as you walked into the greenhouse, by the way, Mel was, she was off your little uh, perch thing on the back of your bag, and she was straight over to her favourite flowers of the greenhouse. Mel can sleep next to us with the flowers, yeah. All right, so uh, what do you, what do you, is there anything you want to talk to or we just skip to you having a sleep here in the greenhouse? They're happy to have you here. Uh, they're gonna finish up their meeting in the uh, in the back room talking about whatever they were talking about. Mel, restrain yourself. Stick to one kind of flower, please. <laughs> you don't wanna be mixing your drinks. Okay, I will, I will, I will attempt to try and stay to my, just my favorite flowers. Are we going to mention now to Charlie that we want to uh, want him to join us? Think about it overnight. Yeah. All right. So you see, uh, Charlie, I've been asked to um, I've been asked to put together a very small crack team of important people, powerful people, that can accompany me to the Great Expanse on a mission to try and track down the source of the Demon Portal and close it. And Charlie, before you ask, says, sign me up. <laughs> and you say, uh, okay, I mean, that's that answers that question, I suppose. I was going to ask you, but it seems you're interested. Um, and Polython, Pol you sort of look towards you and Polython nods ahead and says, I, I, I should stay here. There is much to be taught of the, um, the new, new druid uh, and Brian needs my assistance. Um, but yes, Charlie, I can spare for for a, a cause like this. Charlie is a hundred percent on board. Charlie is confident and uh, likes to be out and about, and uh, is knows that he is he has the skills to help out very strongly in a situation like this. Do we want to ask the dice anything before bed? That's a very good question. We haven't asked the dice anything today. The dice, for those who are relatively new, the dice in this corner here, I'll just need a reminder. The dice are a set of bone dice. I actually have them right here as a physical object. Look, you have a little wooden box that was created by the Fae. It says your name in it, Apis, engraved into it. Thank you very much to Wootenforge for creating this for me. Uh, and inside this little wooden box are a set of bone dice. The dice are the uh, are bones that were that were taken from a centaur. And when you roll these bone dice, you can ask them a question as per the augury spell. And you will get an answer that denotes to either wheel, woe, wheel and woe, or no answer at all. Uh, the closer your question pertains to something that is going to happen, like if you ask about something that's going to happen in the next 10 minutes, the more likely you are to get a very accurate response. But the longer into the future you ask the question about, like something that's gonna happen in a year's time, the more chance that the dice are gonna give you the best estimate that they know, but they might not be, they might not, there's a lot of uh, variables that can change the answer between then and now. What's more is you know that the first answer to the dice that you ask every day is a guaranteed uh, truth. The second and further question that you ask of the dice each day has an increasing chance that it is a randomized answer and so it is not as useful to ask the dice several questions in a day. Could ask the dice about sun protection effectiveness once uh, for one of the options, mud perhaps. Could do, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Ask Charlie and Polython about the sun sickness uh, to, to uh, to cut a long story short, essentially, and not repeat ourselves too much, uh, you ask Polython and Charlie about the sunsickness part of being a myconid, and Polython says that makes sense. The you know mushrooms require darkness in order to li uh, to live, and like too much exposure to uh, to to um, uh, photons uh, can can wilt them. Uh, you ask how might I uh, how might I avoid that and she says I mean short of staying indoors staying in the shade staying in underground um, avoiding light as much as possible she gives you all of the same things that you've thought of uh, consider maybe a parasol or a mud mask or a balaclava not baklava um, 
She's not giving you any options other than has already been explained to you. Casting darkness, for instance. Um, she does, however, as a druid, she does have druid craft, which one of the uh, one of the uses of druid craft is to determine what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. So she is going to use a little uh, use a little weather forecasting druid craft, uh, and she says that the weather tomorrow is going to be slightly overcast and drizzly. So it should help. You won't be in direct sunlight at the very least. Uh, you, with the with the sort of uh, filter effect of uh, the diffuser effect of sunlight behind clouds, it'll still be bright, there'll still be lots of photons around, so it might it might sort of add up to a sickness over time, but you won't be in direct sunlight uh, for most of the day, she says. What that means mechanically is you'll still get sun sickness, but instead of it being 10 minutes out of every 15 minutes, it'll just be a much longer period of time before I start, um, start adding on the, uh, the sun sickness poison. Oh, how about asking the dice, did my imposter learn learn about me from these dice? That could be a good question for it. <clears throat> Battle turns don't last that long. We can just drop the parasol, fight in the sun, and then pick it up again afterwards. Yeah, yeah, a battle. <laughs> I've, I've, I recently had my longest ever battle. And I think it was about 15 or 16 rounds, which is a minute and a half. Uh, can you um, can you cast, uh, what was the spell that, um, that Vala just told me about? Gr uh, greater Restoration, was it? Let me see. Can she cast Greater Restoration uh, spells? I think she's powerful enough to do so. Greater Restoration is a druid spell. It is a fifth level. Uh, what level is Polython? Uh, Polython is a... Yes, she does have fifth level spells. She has sixth level, in fact. So Polython has fifth level spells. It is a druid spell. You ask about the Greater Restoration. She says, uh, yes, I do. I, I, I can prepare that. I don't, uh, I don't have it prepared today because it's a very expensive spell. Um, it does require diamond dust in order to work. Um, I don't have the diamond dust required, but if you asked around in town, um, I'm sure you could acquire it. We'll leave behind the cleansing plant when we sleep. Yeah, that's right, because you've got the um, uh, you've got the um, cleansing creeper, verdant armor. There you go. You've got the verdant armor spell on you, which is a homebrewed spell um, that basically is like a druid's answer to mage armor. You touch a plant and it wraps around you uh, and shifts with you, so it shifts into your wild ship and stuff as well. Uh, and then when you when it run when the spell runs out eight hours later, it just roots itself down to wherever it happens to be. And you have currently got a, a plant called a cleansing creeper attached to you. You, you leave that near the tim. Oh, you did. Thank you, fancy. You you don't have that on you because you uh, you you left it with the the um, the deadwoods. That's right. You wanted to see if it would cleanse any of the deadwoods out. So you don't have it on you. That's true. All remembered. We left it near the termites for them to eat. <laughs> Able to collect spores and use them as some sort of health or recovery buff. Being in a greenhouse could be a good place to find them. Um, they do they do make uh, health potions and things here out of the plants that they're growing, um, but they wouldn't use uh, mushroom spores for it. They use um, uh, they use flannel berries for it. How do we know that fake apis is a changeling? Was that stated explicitly? Um, Joey used the term changeling, and Robert has used the term change changeling, but it could be used colloquially to just mean someone that can change shape. They don't necessarily know that he is a changeling as per the monster manual stat block like they might just be using the term colloquially to mean like a doppelganger a changeling a shapeshifter a a someone a body snatcher there's lots of terms for somebody who does that sort of thing uh give pollen the sample of the uh, the the cleansing creeper yeah smart um she is a, the head of a uh, druid guild that runs a uh, runs a greenhouse here and studies plants so it would be pretty pretty uh, handy you hand over the cleansing creeper and say this is a plant that the merry gentleman gave me from the Feywild that helps to uh, to suck toxins out of the soil. It grows off of those toxins and then you can cut it or uproot it and take it away and suddenly the toxins are all gone. Um, 
uh, and she's very impressed with it. She knows about it. She's uh, she is elf, wood elf herself, and so she's certainly been around long enough to have uh, heard about these fey these fey plants, uh, having studied them her whole life. She's uh, she's she doesn't have a sample of them though, so she's very impressed that you have one and that it's survived because it doesn't normally survive on the material plane all that well. Um, but she takes it. She uh, you you explain why it has survived through the nature magic of it being used as armor. Uh, so it seems that the extension of the spell from that has um, has uh, has kept it alive long enough to adapt it to material plane uh, usage. Anything else you want from Polython or Charlie before you head to sleep? Because it's getting late into the night now, and they need to get back to what they were doing. Let's go rest. Alrighty. So you let them go uh, back to their office. Um, they say they say, well, you know, sleep well. Um, they close the door to the office, and you uh, you get your dice out. Get out your bone dice. We haven't used them in quite some time now, have we? It's been a while since I've used the bone dice. What are we? Uh, what are we asking the bone dice? Apis, the little buzzy bee, buzz. What are we using the bone dice for? What are we asking them? You are guaranteed to get a correct answer, uh, but the answer will be in the form of weal or woe. How about will traveling to Shadridge tomorrow take me closer to the creature who holds the dragon scale braces that I gave to Vala? We could ask a question about the, the braces. I think we'll I think we'll do a poll to get like the topic of the question first, and then we can work the um, we can work the, the the wording of it. So we could ask about the creature that took our braces. Uh, will mud work as a sunscreen? We could ask about the mud mask and whether that's going to be useful against the sunsickness. You could ask about the changeling rather than the braces. Ask about the changeling and say, "Is the person who you know is the person who inter uh, um, impersonated me for the last eight months, the creature that we know as Bobby?" Did these? Uh, we could ask, "Did do, do, did the imposter know about me because of the information that they've gotten from these dice? How did the imposter know about me?" So, we could ask, "Who is who is the imposter?" Try and get that information. How did they know about me? Where are they? I.e. where are my braces? Or nothing about the imposter and instead talk about the sunsickness and how we might um, how we might overcome it. Is there any other thing? Any fifth option? Ask about the mud thing first. Alright, well I'm getting no fifth options coming up so it's going to be those four options. I'll put them to a poll. Wouldn't we know if the mud makes us feel better just by putting mud on us in the daytime and seeing if we uh, feel better? <laughs> that is a very good point, high tech geek. But it will save us the effort and time of putting a mud mask together and putting it on and stuff if we get the answer that's like, nah, it's not going to work. If we find out that mud won't help, do we just not leave Fondurg until we find something that works? We're going to look ten years younger after a few weeks of mud masks. Alright, how are we going on the poll? 50% exactly. 50% exactly want to ask uh, about avoiding the sun. And the other 50% want to ask something about the imposter. Because we did not get a <laughs> a, a majority, 50%, because 50% still wanted something about the imposter, if I was to drop off how did they know me and where is the imposter, those people might all vote for who is the imposter and we get a 50-50 again, or they, some of them might be like, I don't care who the imposter is, I just wanted to know where they are. Um... So, how do I do this one then? I could just go 50-50 coin, coin toss of whether it's mud or imposter, and then ask that again. Um, Alright, to keep things moving, because 50% of you wanted to ask something about mud, uh, something about avoiding the sun, and 50% of you wanted to know something about the imposter, I'm just going to put it down to a 50-50 shot. Let's go odds for, odds for avoiding sun. Yes, okay. So, we're going to ask something about avoiding the sun. Um, we can ask about the imposter stuff later, apparently. The cloak doesn't work, Gardenia, we tried. Uh, we will certainly have like a big thick cloak and hood and stuff, but the point, the, the problem is like just having a hood up over the, in the sun, like you're still in the sun. The sun, the heat of the sun is still getting through your cloak, the, the photons of the sun are still bouncing off of things around you and hitting you in the face. Like imagine it like, which is gonna, which is gonna fare better? A mushroom in a dark cave or a mushroom 
under the shade of a tree on a very sunny day. The mushroom under the shade of the tree is still going to be okay, but it's still out in the sun. It's, it's not indirect sunlight, but there is still sunlight hitting it. Like sunburn when skiing, yeah. Sunburn off of the, the reflection of sun off of other things is still hitting you. There are still photons hitting your skin. All right. Um, so what are we wanting? What, what wording do we want to, to ask about uh, how to avoid this sun sickness? Will a mud layer applied on our skin protect us from or delay the disadvantages of being in sunlight? That's a pretty good worded question. Any, any uh, advance on that? Anybody want to change any of Tree of Dave's wording there? Will the mud layer applied on our skin protect us from or delay the uh, disadvantages of being in the sunlight? I'm going to copy paste that so that we don't lose it. What we need is one of those cartoon clouds that covers over people in a bad mood. <laughs> yeah, Apis just needs to be in a really bad mood so that they get a really cartoony cloud appear over their head at all times. I'm, I'm in real life allergic to the sun. A combo of those things should help, but not completely. Interesting. You're allergic to the sun? Like you have allergic reaction to sunlight? That's fascinating. What do you do when you need to go out and about? Because that would help Apis. <laughs> a thin cloth in front of our face could also work. Yeah, like the, um, like a veil, essentially. Putting a veil over it, like a thin cloth that you could see through but protects us, that would definitely offer some amount of protection for sure. My friend uses sunscreen and a parasol and long gloves. Wow. Well then, doing something like that might help. Any, uh, I'm not seeing anyone adding to or increasing the wording of Tree of Dave's thing, so I guess... That would help, so I guess we're going with this. Will a mud layer applied on our skin protect us from or delay the disadvantages of being in sunlight? Okay, we ask the dice that question. We have that question in our mind. We get the dice out. Let me get my notes up. All right. <clears throat> As you roll the, st the, the bone dice, as each one hits the surface of the, uh, the, thing, the, the surface you're rolling on, you get flashes of different sensations, sights, sounds, smells. Interesting. How's this going to work? Um, you get a sensation of uh, a, a very relaxing and comforting mud bath over your skin. You get the smell of a, um, a, how do you make the smell of mud a good thing? You, you, you get this, you get the smell of a, uh, a, 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 the interior of a spa, um, and it smells delightful. Fresh, fresh dirt. Yeah. You get the smell of fresh dirt. Uh, you see images of um, of a pig just like happy, happily rolling around in mud, um, uh, happy as a pig, happy as a pig in muck, as the saying goes. Uh, you get the yeah, they get the image of mud being splashed up as kids are playing in the mud and like jumping into it with wellies on and <laughs> mud going everywhere. Uh, you get the you get the taste of like earthy uh, earthy roots, like root vegetables. Um, uh, and so on. <laughs> this one's this one's real tough to try and make all of the earthy quality things actually good. But at the end of it, you uh, ultimately get uh, you are left with the feeling of wheel, which, for those who know the dice, means positive or means yes. So as the dice answer yes, uh, wheel. Yeah, you get you have your answer. You have asked the dice one question and gotten one answer. If you want to ask the dice another question before bed, you are welcome to do so. You just know that for every die, every question you ask from this point on, there is not a guarantee that the dice are telling you the correct thing. Mud, 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 mud. <laughs> Epis is Mel's pot belly pig. <laughs> Time to roll in mud. All right, are we going to ask the dice anything else? Yes or no? We could now ask the dice about the imposter thing if we want to. Time to sleep. Time to have a nice prophetic dream. Yep. Now time for dice experiments. Go to sleep. All right, we can ask the question we intend to ask tomorrow instead. All right. 
<laughs> Fancy Fancy's the only one saying yes. Let's ask the dice some things because we know <laughs> we we know the uh, we did some graphs. All right. Well, the overwhelming majority of apices. Nah, it's no time for that. No time for that stuff. We'll uh, we'll go to sleep. And so you say uh, you say now nah, we'll put the dice away. You take your dice. You put them away. Um, and you start to head to sleep. Mel eventually calms down enough from her hype, uh, hyped up pollen producing uh, uh, pollen um, enjoyment uh, that she snuggles down next to you as well and goes to sleep too and you have a long rest so I'm going to click the long rest button on here bling which should reset that was a short rest button Rob bling long rest there you go long rest resets everything and you get all your spell slots back and so on in the night your dreams are nothing you remember. So you wake up in the morning without having a dream. What do you want to do? <laughs> Troll. Fancy was about to murderize me. That's why that's why she hasn't said anything cuz she's just gone. She just closed the she just closed the uh, stream. Just have a big stretch and a strong coffee. Uh, Apis, you wake up. You have a big old stretch. <sighs> You have a plus three dexterity, meaning you are very, uh, very nimble and dexterous. So you probably do do your stretches every morning, making sure to stay flexible. Can't be a uh, can't be a ranger, can't be an archer without be having flexible shoulders, flexible arms. Making sure to do your your morning stretches, your morning exercises. Drop down, do a couple push-ups. Give, give thankful thoughts to the plants that are around us. Yeah, you in the morning, uh, you, you reach out to the plants around you and you give give thanks for them letting you sleep on their flower bed. It was very comfortable night to be in uh, in well, uh, well uh, fertilized and nutritious soil, um, like a nice thick layer of soil uh, that is desi designed and tended uh, by the um, by the, the, the druids and the, uh, the, the plant nerds. Um, it was one of the most comfortable sleeps you've had in a while. And with it being in a greenhouse, uh, it, it was pretty well insulated against the cold weather of the outside as well. Rob, can you review our objectives? Sure. Your main objective is put together a team and head north. You got to try and uh, you got to try and close the portal to the demon world. Let's take some breakfast over to Briar so we don't appear out of nowhere empty handed. Yeah, smart. All right. Uh, is that something we want to do? Do we want to go and uh, do we want to go and say hello to Briar? She might be coming to the greenhouse. It is a um, oh, actually, is it a workday? Let me double check. Um, what time is it? Let's see. Um, uh, we are in we're in a progress now, aren't we? Uh, Apis returns to the Myconids and is transported to the Deadwoods. Blah blah blah. Um, Avoids the termites, heads south to Fonderg, arrives in the early evening at nightfall. You had a meeting, you chatted with uh, chatted with Watson and then came in. Yeah. So we are now on the 9th, which is literally, yesterday wasn't a work day. So the, the meeting and everything was them like, being like, hey, I know, it's a, I know it's a rest day. It's the weekend, essentially. But I need you to come in and chat about stuff. So today is the 1st of, uh, the, the 9th rather, the 9th of Apobris. Um, which is a uh, list a day? No, a fin day. Fin day, the ninth of Apobris. Uh, it is a work day, which means that Briar will probably be coming into the, um, the the greenhouse at some point. If you want to just stay here for her, otherwise you can go to go to her. We've got lots of yeses and nos, so it's a little bit unclear. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down for going to Briar's house. That is slightly south of here, so wrong direction from where you want to be going, but she is a friend and she might be somebody that you want to join you on your team. We don't have time to sort this kind of stuff. There's a spewing demon portal to close. Ask Polython when's Bri when Briar's supposed to turn up. Uh, yeah, in the morning you ask Polython. Uh, Charlie's not here in the morning, um, but you ask uh, you ask Polython, is Briar, is Briar coming? Uh, and she says she'll be here later today. Yes, um, I think she had some duties to perform out in the woods near her home first some uh, some self maintenance and things and i think she'll be coming in around noon we could use the walk to try out the mud protection yeah 
It is a drizzly rain um, this morning, just like on and off showers more than anything. Waiting until noon is way too late to wait. Way too late to wait. Uh, let me just roll to see if, what Polython's going to say about things, if, if anything. Polython uh, sees your uh, concern for, um, for Briar with that high insight check. She realizes why you're asking. And it's not her place to say, she says. It's not my place to say, but Briar is... Um, Briar has been hurt recently. Both physically and emotionally. You would do well to tread carefully around her. She's in a vulnerable place right now. Noon is way off, could we just maybe circle back later or leave a message for her or something? Yeah, you can leave a message for her if you want. Did Fapis get super duper close to her, maybe? Would seeing us upset her, do you think? And she says, uh, it's not, it's not for me to speculate on that. Um, I think she got I think she was mostly hurt by the idea that someone she considered a close friend could have been false the whole time. The, real, the, the revelation that fake Apis had been amongst our midst for eight months hit us all differently. Many of us just took it in stride that that's how things go when fake creatures are around. But Briar, I think, took it more personally, that she was not able to see through someone that she thought a friend that the entire time. Is she avoiding me? She's not avoiding you, no. Um, well, not only you. Briar has been avoiding people in general for some time. She had an accident uh, recently. It's not really my place to say anymore. When this synapse gets a hold of that doppelganger, oh boy. Is there anything we can do to help her? I, I'm i helping her. There's, uh, there's restorative magics that I'm working towards that can help her become who she was once again, I suppose. Um, is that why she was covering her face? Uh, yes. She has scarring. And it is, uh, she thinks, unsightly. Are you, are you using Prince Alv? Prince Alv, unfortunately, has proven ineffective against it. Um, I'm working towards more powerful restorative magics. Can we make like a DC-22 Arcana check to magically fix it? You can certainly try, GM Workshop. Uh, you have proficiency in Arcana and a plus three intelligence, so you do have a plus six Arcana. <laughs> do you need anything for your restorative magics? It is mostly just that I am not quite well-versed enough in its use, uh, more than my lacking any resources. I could try Great Restoration, which is within my purview to do, but as I say, it is an expensive spell. Acquiring the the gold, uh, the diamond dust would be the main point of uh, hold up there. Any chance that print flowers would help? I'm afraid not. We have some print flowers here. The um, the people of uh, Shadridge have been sending print uh, south for some time now. Do you know what um, happened on that mission? L Lieutenant Bluster was, um, or whatever his name was, uh, Gallaby. Gallaby. He was a bit vague on the uh, on the details of the mission. Um, let me roll a percentile check real quick to check something. Oh shit! Almost. I give it a twenty percent chance. I rolled a twenty-one. So not quite. Um. Paladin says, I, I've heard details, um, 
essentially they uncovered they uncovered a trap of some sort and uh and the trap injured many of their party how much uh diamond dust would you need it requires uh and she gives you a a a weight quantity of it um uh, and then says it's usually it depends on market value currently of course uh, i think in times of war when it's useful for so many things the market value may go up uh, the rock gnomes of uh, the mountain range around Fondurg are the ones that provide us with gemstones. Um, usually around 100 gold pieces would do it. Are there any diamonds on the jewellery that we have? Could we pull those out and give them to them? Uh, very good question, Shreve Dave. Let's see. Let's see if there's enough diamonds on your jewellery that you can like crush them into diamond dust. Good luck crushing diamonds into diamond dust, though. Um, chances of there being diamonds... It is dwarven jewelry that you have. Dwarvens, dwarves are miners, and they do sell gemstones quite a lot. So it's pretty decent chance. I'd say a sixty percent chance. No, I'm going to say an eighty percent chance of there being any diamonds, and then I'll roll again to see how many. Yeah. Uh, yep, yeah, fifteen. So there is. Uh, there are diamonds on the things that you have. So you go into your inventory. You can see in the inventory page here. That uh, I've put some I've put some necklaces at the bottom of your quiver to um, to sort of represent uh, a, a bunch of diamond jewelry that you have. Uh, this is from the the hoard from Lucifreak. Uh, Lucifreak was the green dragon that uh, captured you, and after you killed him, you you went to his stash and took a bunch of his stuff. You noticed that a bunch of it was elven jewelry, a bunch of it was dwarven jewelry. Uh, you gave the elven jewelry back to the elves, who said, "Yep, that's ours. That's ours. That's ours." Um, and then they were like, we don't want the dwarven stuff, though, because elves are a little bit xenophobic against other people's cultures and stuff. So they were like, no, we don't want the dwarven stuff. You can keep that. Uh, and so you've got a bunch of dwarven jewelry in your in your quiver. Hearing that you need diamond dust to potentially cure both your uh, sunsickness uh, myconid thing and uh, and Briar's scouring, um, you you get to the bottom of your uh, quiver. You you bring out the dwarven jewelry. Some of it does have diamonds on it. Now I'm going to see how many gold pieces worth of... I'm just going to roll a straight percentile die. Uh, and that is equal to how many gold pieces worth of diamond you have on this jewellery. Actually, I'll give you... I'll give you a percentile plus 20. Percentile plus 20. So there is a chance that you actually have 100 gold pieces worth of diamond on you. Uh, and I'm going to roll it so that you can see it. Dice cam with the Apis box right there. Look, uh, let's move that to the side and give you a D100. Uh, that is an 88. Look at that. Lucky. All right. So there is 88 plus 20. You have 108 gold piece worth of diamond on the jewelry. But I will say you will have to cannibalize the entirety of your. Uh, you will have to cannibalize the entirety of your dwarven jewelry in order to do this. You will have to take it all apart, like all of the dwarven jewelry. That it won't be completely destroyed, but you will have to take you all. You will have to destroy a great deal of it, um, and the, even the stuff that isn't destroyed will be like cl very clearly missing some big diamonds and stuff. Dragons like diamonds. Yep, makes sense. You um you 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 get all this stuff out. Ain't nobody wearing it. Smashy smash. <laughs> Uh, you take it out. You put it. You lay it all on the ground. You, um, you, uh, you. Polython's like, maybe let's take this into my office, shall we? And you, you pick it all up again. You take it into her office. You lay it on her table. You spread it out. You take the pieces that the the couple of pieces that don't have diamonds in them, and you put them away. It's only diamonds. That it can't it can't be rubies or emeralds or sapphires or topaz or you go as a as a dwarf. You have an understanding of a lot of um, uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, gemstones and such even though you are from a town that wasn't a mining town per se you're still just inherently well taught about uh, about about this sort of stuff so you you ask about these things and she says unfortunately no the properties of a diamond is what's needed for the spell you put all the other stuff back in you take all of the ones that are that have some kind of diamonds in them <clears throat> we could donate the rest to Polythen to fund helping Briar you could if you want yeah Maybe make sure none of it's magical. Uh, we've already done that slide. None of this is magical jewelry. This ruins the joke of us wanting to fire a jewelry arrow. <laughs> Before we hand it over, see if we can get it turned to dust by an arcanist casting shatter on them. Uh, it's it's possible. 
before we smash it, do we recognize any of it on a closer look just in case? Let me see. Do you recognize any of it? Let's make an investigation check. Apis's neurons are firing. <clears throat> the synapses are telling them. Dwarven jewelry. Lucifreak stole a bunch of his hoard from his father, Ungehef, who attacked my hometown of Shafgushal. There is a chance that Ungerhef stole a bunch of my family or my, my town, my neighbor's jewelry, and then Lucifreak stole it from his father, and now I have my family's jewelry. So with that in mind, I'll have you make an intelligence check or an investigation check, let's make it. You can see under proficiencies, you, you are not proficient in investigation, uh, so it's just gonna be a straight three. And uh, I need I need more monitors because I keep having to jump around too many screens. All right, uh, what am I on? I need dice cam. There we go. With a ten, you can just about see that on the edge of the camera there. Ten plus three, that's a thirteen investigation check. It's recognizable as dwarven. It's n you don't recognize any of it as like your mother's jewelry or like your sisters or anything like you don't if it was if somebody around town what did wear it then you weren't paying attention uh the last time you saw all of your family and stuff you were about 50 years old which in dwarven terms is about a 25 year old uh and so you had your first formative years in the in the town and probably didn't pay too much attention to what people were wearing and things um uh, dwarves don't have a lot of focus on their fashion um, they don't do a hell of a lot of, of like making themselves look all that fancy and so from time to time when you did see your mother wearing jewellery um, this none of this looks like her jewellery um, not directly anyway it does look definitely dwarven made though I kind of want to re-roll lucky horse you maybe if you guys want to re-roll on that make sure that you uh, roll even higher and be absolutely double double sure that none of this belongs to your many of which are deceased family. If it was someone's, it was a normal villager, probably not family, so all good to wreck it. <laughs> it's, all, it's only other people's family jewels then, right on, smash away. <laughs> Would it matter? Exactly, right? Even if it, even if you recognised it and it was like, oh, this is my mother's heirloom. If it, if it, if it's, if it means, uh, if it means having the material components for casting a spell, my mother would want me healed. All right, now nah, we're not going to re-roll it with the with the um, thing in Bob. So we're just going to be like, well, maybe it was somebody's family jewelry one time, but maybe not. Hey, we can always get more jewelry, right? Dish. All right, so uh, you start to break open the pieces of jewelry, the necklaces and things, um, and you uh, you go down to a, a very small number of jewel. You still have some dwarven jewelry in your quiver, but it's a very small amount now, and none of it has diamonds. So somebody remind me that in like several episodes time when it becomes important and somebody's like, oh, what about the jewelry in our thing? Do we have any diamonds? Somebody remind me, no, actually, we used all of the diamonds for that thing we did. Um, okay, you take all of the diamonds out. You donate the rest of these now ruined pieces of jewelry to Polython and say, look, if you need, if you can make use of any of the rest of it, uh, please do so. Um, you know, uh, consider it funding the for your war efforts and whatever uh there's some there's some jewelry still in there there's some like gold and things that's going to be useful if you melt it down uh keep the rest um then you are you have uh, 108 gold pieces worth of diamonds but it needs to be in dust form so how do you want to dust it do you want to just leave it with polython and be like look this is your problem now find someone to dust it I'm, i've got a mission to do or do you want to actually go and get the dust because you want to do the restoration like right now because what she could do she did prepare now that it's a new day she did prepare greater restoration today if you can get this uh this these diamonds dusted right now she can perform greater restoration and remove you of your um, of your myconid curse and then the whole mud bath thing becomes a moot point because you can go about the rest of this arc of the campaign without being a myconid no it's for briar it's not us that's a choice you have to make you can use it for briar you can see it, keep it for yourself you could also go into town and see if you can find 92 more gold pieces worth of, of diamonds do we need a jeweler or an arcanist 
Uh, you, either one would be able to work. Arcanists would potentially uh, be more efficient at it. They might just be able to cast a single spell that just shatters it all or whatever. I suppose a hammer won't do. A hammer would get you so far. Like, you can, you can definitely hammer the things. It would just be like... It would be time, essentially. You could definitely dust this yourself with a hammer and enough time. Do we have 92 gold pieces on us? Uh, we do have we do have the equivalent of 92 gold pieces. I th oh, maybe not, actually. What do we have? Let's have a look. Uh, on our person, we have uh, one platinum piece, which is equivalent to 10 gold pieces, and then 47 gold pieces, and 13 gold piece worth of equivalent of, uh, of silver. So what's that? 60... We've got 70 gold pieces worth of, uh, worth of coin on us, but you would have to go and buy... You'd have to go and buy diamonds and maybe trade some things. And... Demushrooming us would be pra more practical for the sake of the war. Yeah. All right, let's put a thumbs up, thumbs down just for the first question, which is, do we want to go Briar or us? Let's go uh, thumbs up for Apis, because they are taller, uh, and thumbs down for Briar, because they're tiny and short. So do you, want to, do you want to thumbs up, try and get yourself cured of the mushroom thing? Thumbs down, try and get Briar cured of her scarring and uh, pro whatever problems she's facing. Ooh, interesting. I might have to put this to an actual poll because it's uh, it's definitely not an, uh, definitely not obvious which one is in charge, which one is in the lead. Apis would definitely help Briar first. Apis is smart though, and uh, I can see it. I can see it argued both ways. Sly. Apis is definitely someone who helps others in need. So that is def that definitely does feel like Apis to do that, but they are also not stupid, and they know that being at a disadvantage when they're going to attack some demon portals might be pretty pretty dumb. Ooh, okay, this is uh, this is hard. I uh, it's definitely down the middle, so I'm gonna have to put this to an actual poll so that we get the um, get the actual answer. Help Briar or us. She's our friend, and we help those in need. We already know that she's incredibly torn up by the fact that she didn't spot the fake. Very good point. Helping Briar was a, is a very good thing to do. But is it better than helping yourself right now? It's a moral quandary of like, there's no doubt Apis would want to help Briar, but is the greater good to help themselves and then leave Briar with the cash to say, here, buy some diamonds and help yourself. Being a mushroom does have advantages. It comes with serious disadvantages too. Save yourself first and then the next person on the, uh, like on an aeroplane. Ooh, okay, so it did come back down to a close call. It was 58% to 42%. So with 58% of the vote, we decide we are going to demushroom ourselves first. So you mentioned this to Paul and you say, look, you said you can take away this mushroom stuff from us if you, if, if I have this threat. So, and it's the same thing that you would do for, for uh, Briar. And she says, I... I think so. I, I would definitely try it on Briar, and I have reason to believe it would work. But there's also the chance that it it, it requires even more strong magic for helping Briar. Um, as for you, it would definitely work on you because it's just realigning what your body should be. And so you get the confirmation that yes, she will happily do it for you right now today if you can if you can get this these diamonds dusted. So, what? We didn't even ask if we want to do the mushroom. We did ask that last time, Abyss, in the in the previous episode. We asked, uh, do we want to demushroom ourselves? And the answer was yes, we do eventually want to demushroom ourselves. Um, and so it has been on Apis's mind to be like, this is a this is a detriment. Either now or later, I definitely am going to get rid of this mushroom curse. So now that you've got the option, I didn't want to ask it again. Um, what uh, what are you doing about the um, what are you doing about the diamonds then? Are you going to just smash them up yourself? You can do so. It would take a little bit of time. Uh, do you want to go off into town now and find either a jeweler or a blacksmith or a someone someone who can smash them up, or go into town and find an arcanist who's going to cast some sort of magic on it to smash them up? You also need to visit Valor anyway to drop off the cyclamide parts and the blood and stuff, right? How much is the gold and jewels worth that we left? Is that enough to buy dust for Briar? Uh, the stuff that you, that, like the leftovers that you left would probably be like a couple of gold because you cannibalized the most important parts of the jewelry, which was the diamonds uh, and the rest of it's kind of broken and stuff. So they could, with a charismatic enough person selling it, you could sell the remnants of all of the, um, remnants of all of the remainder jewelry um, 
you can you can uh, that person will be able to sell it to a jeweler for like a few gold. Let's go to a jeweler, remove the stones, probably sell the remainder. Go to an Arcanist for smash and give give the stuff to Valor while we're there. Ask Valor when we drop the stuff off. Spend an hour smashing the diamonds ourselves. Anyone else would uh, have to take the time, so we may as well do it ourselves. Let's leave enough gold to take care of the dust that Brian needs too. Would Jeweler have it as a byproduct of shaping diamonds? There's a chance that a Jeweler would also just have diamond dust on them and wouldn't take time to actually... You can just trade your solid diamond for some diamond dust. Let's go see Valor, give her blood and ask if she can have someone dust the diamonds. All right, we got some uh, we got some uh, question to ask. So, poll: How to obtain diamond dust? Do we want to go to Vala, who is the arcanist, who can probably cast some magic to da dust these diamonds instantly, but she'll probably ask a favor or some money in return? Uh, do we want to go to a jeweler, who can who may have some already on hand and save you the um, save you the time? A jeweler. Uh, or do we want to do it ourselves, which would save us money, but take some time? Those are the three options we've got. No way that we can smash diamonds ourselves in an hour. We'd need something harder to smash it with or to use magic. Yeah, you can smash them, but it would it would probably take you more than an hour. Which incidentally would maybe take you up to noon, and then and then uh, buyer arrives and you get to meet her and see what the deal is. Go to Valor first, smash the diamonds, blood, body parts and blood, go to the jeweler, buy the dust. Alright, 75% of you decide we're going to a jeweler to get this done. Our blood? Oh yes, because uh, she wants to she wants to study Mykonid blood, right? That's right. Testing the shroomies for Valor to slow to slow regen stuff, yes, that's right. She wanted to test test Mykonid blood, because Valor is uh, a wizard with a blood slash fire focus. She has fascination with uh, blood magics. For whatever reason. I'm sure that's nothing nefarious or anything you're going to need to worry about later. She's totally above the board and on the level. We probably don't have time, but was any of the leftover jewelry bits silver? And if so, can we make silver arrows? Uh, that would take some time, silks and fingers. That would take like some. You definitely wouldn't be leaving Fondog today if you want to make silver arrows. Um, but you you have enough silver pieces. You have 137 silver coins, and you could you you could make silver arrows out of that stuff. Valor's definitely not friends with a necromancer. That's definitely not been established, and she's definitely not studying blood magic. She doesn't. Yeah, definitely doesn't have a necromancer friend. <laughs> Stop it, Robert. Even if she's friends with old chap, I don't think he, she's bad. Maybe. Maybe not. All right, jeweler then. So you are going to a jeweler. 75% uh, of Apis has decided, let's get this stuff dusted. So you head to a jeweler in town. I'll hand wave over the moving, uh, going from the greenhouse to town. You get a little wet on the way. Uh, it's a little bit um, overcast. So uh, you spend a good half hour in the, um, you spend a good half hour out in the overcast day without feeling the sickness of the sun. Uh, it's still very early morning as well, so probably like only like nine, eight or nine in the morning. Put the diamonds back in the quiver. Obviously, you don't, don't want to lose them getting mugged. Uh, you head to the front gates. You persuade them to open up for you, and you head inside, finding a jeweler. Uh, you head towards the sort of east east side of town, where more of the jewelers are, more of the rock gnome population of this town is, uh, and you find a jeweler. Uh, let's call him. Let's put him under NPCs of Fonderg. Um, duh, 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 duh. Where are we, Fonderg? What do we call in this this uh, this this gnome? Gnomes love names, remember. So what do we call in this gnome? I'm gonna put him under shopkeepers. I don't have a jeweler already, do I? Um, Gretchen. Yeah, let's make a let's make a, a Gretchen. Gretchen the gnome. Gretchen what? We've been there before, right? I think we did go to a jeweler once before, yeah, after we got mugged and we were trying to get some money back or something. Can't remember what we named that guy, though. Gretchen Squirt Gerabald. That's what her name is. Gretchen Squirt Gerabald. Gerabald. Gretchen Squirt Gerabald Sparkle Sparkle Muffin. I like Sparkle Sparkle Muffin. <laughs> She's got two different names, Sparkle and Sparkle Muffin. <laughs> 
flibbity gibby mcgibby libby <laughs> i mean fuck it why not i love no i love gnome names all right that'll do though uh flibberty flibber d flibbity gibby flibbity get jesus flibbity gibby mc mcgibby libby mcgibby libby uh, Gretchen Squirt, Gerbold Sparkle, Sparkle Muffin, Flibbity Gibby, McGibby Libby. <laughs> All right, that's who the that is the uh, uh, rock gnome, rock gnome um, jeweler. And then while I'm at it, I'm going to open up my NPC creator table and see what sort of a person she is. All right, we've already got her race. We've already got her uh, sex. She presents female. Uh, age is a percentile by human equivalent. Oh, she's quite young. Uh, she's only in her early 20s. Uh, let me write this down. Using my NPC table. I love the muck. Yeah, she's uh, she's got some Scottish heritage, Scottish clan maybe with the muck. Wait, no, Mac is Scottish and muck is Irish, right? Mac, Mac Dougal, Mac. Look, you didn't get a dream. I had to give you a huge name, fancy. <laughs> Rock gnome jeweler, uh, early twenties, uh, female presenting. Um, uh, physical description. Let's have a look at her skin. What is her skin like? She has. What's that? Just lost my dice. Uh, four on the skin. Able-bodied and flawless skin. Uh, able-bodied flawless skin what else we got attractiveness how attractive is she three she is she's relatively plain looking uh, and but doesn't dress very well um, plain Jane dresses poorly doesn't have a lot of pride in her, her dress sense uh, and then her wealth does she has is she outwardly wealthy uh, she seems to be outwardly wealthy. She uh, dresses poorly, but is somehow worse, but is wealthy. Makes sense. She's a jeweler. Um, and then her skin, hair, and eye tones. Let's have a look with that with the D4. Uh, four. She's got light. She's on the lighter side. Uh, lighter tones of skin, hair, and eyes. And that was her appearance. And then as you walk in, you're going to learn her personality, so I might as well roll for that now. And, ooh, there we go. We've got a 20. Ooh, interesting. Oh, shit. Okay. I'll keep that secret. Um, uh, and then this one again, which is a... What else on my table? Uh, she's quite talkative. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Has she got any fears? We just rolled the BBEG, guys. <laughs> She's fun. I like this lady. She's going to stick around for a while. All right. And if there, any of that stuff comes up as important, I will write it out. Okay. We'll roll it. We'll roll it if and when her sexuality and stuff actually comes up. So if you want to try and hit on her, I'll roll to see if she's interested in your kind. Alrighty. <clears throat> I already do want to do an insight check on anything she says. <laughs> it might work with the fiend. Maybe. Maybe. She's fun. It's fine. She's going to end up coming along on the mission because Rob likes this character too much. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Super rich celebrities that goes out in simple hoodie and jeans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very much that kind of uh, vibe. Okay, so she, uh, so you walk into uh, Gretchen's shop. What does she, uh, what does she, what's the name of her jewelry, jewelry store? In case you, um, in case, in case you, you want any inspiration. Her name is Gretchen Squirt Garibald Sparkle Sparkle Muffin Flibbity Gibby McGibby Libby <laughs> FML Jewelry. Julie, Julie the jewelry. We definitely should hit on her. Remember how well romance went for us last time we hit on a shopkeeper? Yeah. Sparkle, sparkles. Sparkle muffin, sparklies. Sparkle muffin, sparklies. Yeah, I like that. Sparkles, sparkle, sparklies, I think. Uh, Rock gnome jeweler, jeweler runs 
Spackles, spacklies. There you go. So you event you. It doesn't take you very long to find spackles, spackles, spacklies, um, and you head into the jewelry shop. Tring. Um, and she's uh, she's sitting up there, um, uh, uh, tap tinkering away at something with like one of those like several uh, telegraphed. Uh, um, telegraphed is that the right word? Uh, telescope, telescopic. Um, she's got one of those telescopic lens uh, eyeglasses on. We're not getting to Shadridge today, I guess. Um, maybe I don't know. Depends. Depends how quickly all the rest of this goes. Uh, you walk in there. You. Uh, she looks up and well, she startles herself because she. Uh, she. Uh, she's looking at you super close. She can see the pause in your nose. Whoa. Uh, she... Hello. What can I get for you? What do you want? What do you say? We don't like the vibe and leave immediately. <laughs> Fuck you, Spates. I lock the doors. You cannot leave. How good is her work that's laying around? Let's make an, in in, uh, an investigation check for you with a dice cam. Bloop. And the investigation check, that is a seven. Seven plus your investigation of three. You don't know a lot about jewelry. You know a decent about like raw gemstones because you're a dwarf. But once it's been worked, you don't know a lot about it. You walk over and it looks nice. That's as far, excuse me. That's as far as you can tell with a ten. Uh, it looks like nice enough jewelry. Um, hello. What's your favourite fear? Large animals, she says. Large animals? No, not so. Uh, not so keen on big, big animals. Because uh, I'm pretty tiny. Wondering, uh, I was wondering if you have any diamond dust for sale. Diamond dust. Let me see if she knows what that's for. She doesn't. She goes, diamond dust? Not that, so, like the old offcuts of my diamonds. Yes, uh, I'm looking for diamond dust. It's a useful component in a magical spell. Oh, right. Um, let me see if I've got some for you. She is going to do a little, she's going to do a little investigation in her back room, see if she can find it. She comes out with a small pouch of dust after some clattering and clinking and stuff. It's like a good five minutes that she's left and goes in the back thing, but she comes back out with a small pouch of dust and she uh, puts it on the on the desk, gets out a little um, weighing scales and she puts it on the weighing scales. She does a little tinkering with that and working out this stuff and that stuff and she goes, um, for the amount that I've got here, I could give you it for 36 gold. Love the shop name, by the way. Oh, thank you. It's named after me. My, my name's Sparkle. Or, one of my names is Sparkle. Whilst she's in the back room, can we move the diamonds from our quiver to our pocket so she doesn't know where we keep it on our person? Yes, we do that. Um, could we maybe, uh, could we maybe trade, like, solid diamonds for your diamond dust of an equivalent amount? And she says, um, yes, of course. I, why? Oh, for the spell, right. And di just solid diamonds doesn't work for the spell. You see, it works for some spells, but not the one that we need. Um, you take out some of your diamonds and you weigh out an equivalent amount, 36 gold worth of diamonds, and she uh, she she is happy to accept that trade. So you now have 36 gold uh, worth of diamond dust and whatever the fuck I said before, that minus 36 worth of diamonds. Let's do some maths, shall we? Uh, so you had 108 gold pieces, you've used, uh, you're down to 72, is that right? 36, yeah. 72 gold pieces worth of diamonds and you have 36 gold of diamond dust. You ask her, um, can we, do you, do you perform the service of like, if we give you more solid diamonds, you could like actually turn them into dust for us? She says, uh, yes, I suppose I can do that. Can we investigate to see if she's giving us a fair deal? This would be an insight check. You absolutely can. Let me roll your dice for you with an insight. Uh, and to t to show you the uh, page where you can see, you don't have insight um, uh, as a proficiency. So it'll just be straight two from your wisdom. Uh, so that is a seven. Seven plus two is a nine. With a nine, you get the impression that she's done it all by the book it's there's that she's used scales in front of you and the scales seem to be uh seem to be not lying how long would it, tur it take to turn this into dust and you hand over the the next 64 pieces required for 100 you hand over 64 gold worth 
Could we please buy it with gold and get all of the diamonds dusted? I see. So you want all all the remaining remainder of your diamonds dusted. Chat doesn't want to pay with the diamonds. Okay, so you pay with the gold instead. All right. So let's go to your inventory page. Bing! And we'll pay with 36 of this. 36 off of 47 is 11. Uh, so you pay with the gold. You say, actually, scratch that. Um, could you turn all of these into dust? <laughs> and she's she's like, uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, it'll take me. I don't know. Maybe if I, hmm. you. Hmm. So it'll cost you for the service of doing it. I'll say, for the amount of time it'll take, the wear on my machines. Um, I'll say I'll do it for five gold pieces, and it'll take me about three hours if you want it done even faster I can prioritize it but it will cost you a little bit more let's say seven gold pieces and then I can prioritize it I'll have it done within an hour seven gold let's go <laughs> seven gold five gold and come back in three hours five gold is fine we'll be back in three hours seven gold three hours five gold thumbs up for seven thumbs down for five we want to go with the five hour, five gold option, it seems. All right, so we're going with the five gold option. We think about it, but we're like, yeah, we'll give you five gold and you take your time on it and, uh, and we'll come back in three hours. So we give, the, give her five gold uh, to do the thing for us. We give her all of the diamonds um, and we leave to go do our other jobs in the meantime. Um, all right, so you head from here to Valor's place. You uh, manage to make it all the way to Valor. Can we give a 20 silver more to get that to seven? We're carrying over a hundred silver. We are carrying a lot of silver. <laughs> we could have paid in the silver if you want to. Um, let's say you paid in three of the three of the 30. There you go. Uh, so we'll go down to 108, 108 instead, just to get rid of some of your silver and go back up by three there. Um, but no, we uh, we decided that we were going to do the three hour option sparrow as a uh, as a hive mind collective. They decided, nah, three hours is fine. I mean, guys, we'll get distracted and take more than three hours to get back anyway. <laughs> Wait, can we weigh the diamonds before they're dusted to make sure we get it all back? Um, as you're leaving the shop, you're like, oh, uh, could I weigh the diamonds before I get it dusted? I'm going to roll a charisma check to see if she is offended by your accusation straight to her face that she might try and rip you off. Um, so uh, roll a charisma check, just straight charisma which is a four, a four plus your charisma modifier of one is a five. <laughs> and she goes, did you just imply that I'm, did you just imply that I'm going to rip you off? Would you like to lucky horse through that? Thumbs up, thumbs down or lucky horse through thumbs down. <laughs> well, she wasn't going to rip us off before. <laughs> All right, a lot of people saying yes, lucky horse through that. All right, so here it goes. Uh, if I click the right thing. <laughs> Off goes the lucky horse through. You reroll that to see if you can do better than a four uh, with a 12. 12 plus one is better than four plus one. Um, <laughs> it's, I'm going to say, I'm not going to tell you why, but I will tell you it is, it is very lucky that you lucky horse through that. And I'll leave it at that based on something that I rolled about her personality <laughs> when I was rolling it before and kept something redacted. It is lucky that you, you lucky horse shoot, lucky horse shoot that. Um, sh you, you go, uh, can I weigh it? And, and you, and she says, do you just imply I'm going to rip you off? And you said, Oh no, 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 no. I'm so sorry. Um, I, no, not at all. No, no, no. I was just really fascinated about the whole process that it takes. And I want to know just how much is lost in the process. I've never dusted diamonds before as a dwarf. I've uh, mined diamonds before, you lie. Uh, I've mined diamonds before, but you know, I've not actually dusted them or turned them into things. So I was just fascinated to know like how much is lost. And you managed to, with your lucky horse shoe, get, get yourself out of what could have been an offensive kind of situation. Um, and uh, I just want to make sure I give you enough for the spell. And, uh, and so she goes, oh yeah, of course. And she brings you back over. She gets the scales back out. She, she, uh, she weighs them out and shows you how much you've got, uh, you know, um, tells you exactly how much it weighs. Whew. and you have avoided something that could have been bad um 
you leave the shop, you go over to Vala's place uh, and you make it all the way there. She's busy, but um, the assistant, uh, Nira, I think her name was, uh, lets you in. Uh, you you eventually wait for 10 minutes or so before she's you know uh, available to see you again. And then she brings you in and you drop off the... Um, how much does it weigh, Rob? I don't fucking know, Batmurp. <laughs> I knew somebody would ask me that. I don't... It weighs as much as 108 gold pieces worth of diamond weighs. Not very much, probably. <laughs> Will we get enough dust out of it for, for both ourselves and Briar? No. You'll get 108 gold pieces worth of that, and you'll get the 36 gold pieces from before, and you need... Uh, yeah, you'll get roughly one and a half... Uh, one and a half uses of it. Kilograms or pounds? <laughs> ounces, probably. It'll it would be it would be measured in ounces. It, it weighs approximately one spell. <laughs> Full size diamonds are worth far more than dust. It's worth what it's worth to you, and you have played your hand openly, saying we need this for a spell. So she's going to charge you the same as it would be if it was the same uh, same amount. So like. Yep, they are worth they're they're worth more, but I mean worth is only what you're what somebody is willing to pay for it. All right, you head to Valors. You hand off the uh, the body parts that you have. I think have we actually put, got them in the inventory? Uh, did we put guts in the inventory? I don't think we did. Here we go. Let me add let me add valuables. Uh, not valuables. Sorry, uh, trophies, isn't it? Uh, trophies. Uh, guts. You had some. Have I just hidden the guts? There they are. You had some, you had some uh, cyclopede guts. You had some cyclopede guts in your inventory that you then hand off to be like, here's some cyclopede stuff and some interesting body parts of things. We then take uh, a vial of, well, she takes out a vial of blood, uh, a vial, an empty vial, and uh, and pricks your finger to take some of your myconid blood, and you tell her we're going to get it fixed today. So like, we won't have any more to give you after this. We're just heading off. I'm just getting the. Um, the diamonds dusted uh, and blah blah blah. You hand off the mold as well. Uh, yes, you had a little vial of mold, which was this one here, right? The blue, the blue one was the mold, as from memory. Uh, you hand off the vial of mold. You're like, this is the mold that turned us into. Was it that mold, or was it a different mold? It was a different mold, wasn't it? Uh, the brown mold turned you, and you also collected some a sample of the yellow mold. I think. Was the blue one the pure water? Ah, we had pure water. Okay, potions. Blue potion. There you go. We've still got the vial of water. Proceeds to drain all of our blood. Yeah. The guts and thing we were going to rapier. Okay. Well, you don't need to. You don't need the guts for that. You just need the cyclopede bits. Yeah. You just need the um, proboscis, which we'll do there. Nice menu you have there. I know, right? Pretty cool. Pretty cool menu of all of the different items and stuff. The prick and vial turns into a deep cut, cut and bucket once she hears that she won't get any more of it. Yeah, she takes, she, she does take two vials uh, with you telling her, yeah, you won't get any more myconid blood after this. She goes, I'll just take a second one as well then. And she fills up a second blood, of, uh, second vial of your blood as well. She's not going to take more than that. Uh, second, with, with her proficiencies as a high level uh, wizard the way that she is, um, she, she can use it to good effect and like study it without wasting it essentially. Also, um, mum's the word on that mention of the dinner at the fiends. By the way, when I uh, when I mentioned the fiend, that's not something I'm meant to be telling people about. I just thought that you might have heard of him before. And she goes, "Right, I I will keep it to myself." She can totes to make a voodoo doll of us now. She totes can, but it's okay, Race. As I said before, she doesn't have any nef nefarious purposes. She's a high level wizard that's studying blood magic, uh, that definitely knows a necromancer that's hiding out in the woods. She definitely won't use your blood to any nefarious effect. In D&D, it's perfectly safe to give your blood to people. Whoever you want. There's no spells that specify that you have disadvantage on certain saving throws if they have a vial of your blood or anything like that. There's no demons that specify that they can do certain things to you only if they have some of your blood or anything like that. That's fine. So you're, you're totally fine. You're totally, totally fine. Fake Apis the Third coming soon. <laughs> the Sanguine Arts are perfectly respectable. Yes. Does she have a use for the tusk or feather? Does she have a use for them? Um, you ask her that and she says, not off the top of my head. 
if you want to leave them with me, I might be able to come up with something in the future at some point, but I've got nothing immediately right now that would be useful with a tusk or feather. Good thing that's the case. I was really worried there for a little, yeah. Blood and name. Definitely things you can totally give out in D&D. Yeah. It's a good thing that Vala has both your full real name and now vials of your blood. It's like you never spent time in the Feywild. Um, d and is just like real life. Giving people your blood is always a good idea. It's just one vial of blood, Michael. How much can it cost? Ten immortal souls? Sweet reference. I probably don't have to tell you, but be careful with those vials, please. Demons abound and all that. She says, of course, I I, I know what I'm doing when it comes to uh, protecting people's uh, literal body and soul. Pretty sure Edith would know all about this. She'll tell us when, she, when we see her next. Hello. You have to speak with plants, right? Not the other one. Um, <laughs> special points for the names written in blood. Yeah. Is that a known <laughs> having diamond dust? Uh, you ask. Uh, do you have any diamond dust by the ch by any way by any chance? Uh, let's find out if she does. Unlikely, because I don't think you use diamond dust in a lot of wizard spells. It's mostly cleric stuff that you use diamonds for. Um, she, ooh, almost, but no, she doesn't. Uh, I give it a twenty percent chance, and I rolled a twenty-nine. So no, she doesn't have any. She says, I had a little diamond dust before, but um, I used it in something. I can't remember what now. It was a artificer um, a contraption that I was working on, I think. Uh, I'm afraid I'm afraid I'm all out. The, I'm sure jewelers would have plenty of diamond dust they'd be willing to sell you. Edith will reassure us, speak with live humans. Yeah, we have that. <laughs> is the blood still us after we got rid of the curse? How big is the change? You will find out, won't you? If she ever uses it for any nefarious re reasons. Uh, in the meantime, you've uh, you finished with everything you needed from Valor, I believe. You wanted to go to a blacksmith to see if they could make a rapier out of your proboscis. Is that correct? And then you also want to hit up another jeweler to see if you can get the, the uh, gold needed. The, the rest of the diamond dust needed. Uh, you also have not chosen anybody else for your team. You've just got Charlie. Is there anything else, anyone else that you want to approach today to ask if they want to come with you? Make a rapier or just switch a sword for the rapier. I just shared the decision to share the blood with my D&D table mates and they're screaming. <laughs> Didn't we just want to trade our sword for a rapier? Yeah, you can do that if you want, yeah. Could we sell a thousand arrows to the war effort for 44 gold to buy the rest of the diamond dust? You could try, Batmurp. You'd like someone from the knights? Joey? Alright, so people are, people are down for asking Joey if he wants to come with you. Uh, you can do that if you want. Uh, is that what you're doing now? Or is there anything else more pressing that you want to do now? Like, do you want to go to, back to uh, find a different jeweler and see if you can get some gold, uh, some, some diamond dust? Or do you want to go try and find Joey now? Or go to a weaponsmith and find a rapier? We can trade proboscis for a rapier later, but we can't wait for the proboscis rapier to be made right now. That is correct. I prefer Mosh, but we'd have to find him first. Yeah. Go for the meeting. Go for Joey. All right. You go to uh, you go to find Joey by going to the center of town where people are not allowed the general public because it's been cordoned off. Remember, uh, you get there and you say, "Hey, I'm here to try and find Joey. Uh, somebody's going to go find him. He's a Briton, so he doesn't need a lot of sleep. So he's been working all hours these days. Uh, how long is it going to take them to find him? Let's just roll a d20 for 20 minutes." 17. It's going to take 17 minutes to find Joey. So it's taken you're about you're about 40 minutes after maybe about 50 minutes after your um yeah, about 45 minutes after um after leaving the jeweler um uh, you've you've you're now meeting up with Joey. Uh Joey comes to to see you um and he was did you say he was Welsh from memory? He's got he was raised by his elven side, wasn't he? Oh, was he not? He was. He was Welsh. Thank you. He says, um, uh, yes, Apis, uh, what is it? What can I help you with? And you explain, I've got a quest to do up in the, up in the north and blah, blah, blah. Do you want to come with me? Um, does he want to come with you? Let's see. Make a persuasion check. 12. 12 plus your persuasion modifier, which I think is just a 1 because you don't have much in the way of charisma. Uh, you're not proficient in it, so just a 1. So with a 13, he thinks about it and he says it would be it would be very nice to um, 
would be very nice to be able to actually go back to some sort of normality in town if we can get this war ended fuck it why not yeah i'll go with you i'll uh, i'll have to run by my superiors and see that they're okay with it okay with me leaving but um i'm in joey's in we really lack people skills we really do yes yes we really do can we explain to him that if we find someone more suited for the mission, we can always send him back to Fondog with a report if that's what's stopping him? Yeah, you explain that and he goes, all right, yes, um, I'll at, I'll at the, let's say I will at the very least accompany you to Shadridge then. Second husband bonus. <laughs> all right, and as Apis gets together Wraith's little polycule, um, <laughs> is there, you wanted, to, you wanted a meeting. Who did you want at this meeting? Who did you want to fetch? What was the meeting about? It was about uh, obtaining things that you didn't need to run around and get yourself, right? Somebody get me a rapier. Somebody get me holy water. Somebody do this and this and this. Joey, um, can we help uh, guard a supply cart on the way up? Maybe catch a ride, but also be useful. And he says, uh, yes, I was I, I was just thinking that myself. I was, um, I was going to look at when the next supply cart sets off and we set off together and uh, we... Um, we use the opportunity to to be useful, as you say. How many husbands does it may take to make a forest and get forest bonus? <laughs> Whoever lets us get the healing permit, a rapier, some holy water, and some other supplies and stuff. All right. We should probably fill in Cop Colonel Blowhard and all these others from the last time of having formed our team as well. Yeah. All right. Um, is there a, a chance uh, that I could sell the water for some arrows? By the way, I've got. I've got arrow you take arrows out of your quiver, you take more arrows out of your quiver, you're like, look, I've got arrows that just keep ha keep coming, and I'm happy to sell them to the war effort uh, for the gold that I need to help someone. And he says, uh, I can, I can find, uh, I can find out if that's something someone, if I can find someone who would w be willing to buy those from you, I'm sure. Um, but he does now look at the quiver and goes, hmm, as if to be like, that's an interesting, interesting item there that could be useful. Um, you place the bundle of place the bundle of arrows back in your uh, in your quiver. Um, I believe Wraith, uh, we, he, uh, Batmap was saying the regular ones that seem to seem to be infinite. <laughs> no, there's my quiver. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, he prepares the meeting for you and says, "Come back in a half an hour, and I'll have I'll have everybody here for you." Um, so you've got half an hour to just line, wander around, try and find some more jewelers, try and find some more diamond dust worth, uh, and then get a bunch of, uh, and then go back to the meeting where you'll have a bunch of people. Seem to be infinite. Yes, seem to be infinite. We don't need need more money. Are we out of money? Visit the stash. You are way south of the stash, stash right now. Uh, the stash is north of uh, Shadridge. Apis does not know that it's infinite. <laughs> Uh, Apis does not know that it's not infinite. Apis has taken out uh, up to, I think, 60-something. You took, like, 60-something or 30-something arrows out of your quiver before you were like, it's essentially infinite. And then you just kind of decided to act as if it's infinite. Can we get a read on Joey's reaction to the quiver? Sure, I will uh, give, you a, give you an insight check with a... 14 yeah 14 uh, 14 plus your insight of two with a 16 you get the impression that uh, he is as a mil military man he is acknowledging how useful it would be for the war effort to have a quiver that con that constantly um, constantly refills itself that's pretty much all that you're gonna read like he's possibly going to relay that to people and be like oh this is an idea maybe we should have a quiver like that Maybe he's going to take it to the Arcanists and request them to enchant some quivers like that. Or maybe he's going to put it to his superior and the superior is going to be like, Hey, Apis, we're, in the name of the king, we're going to commandeer your quiver. Could go either way. Ask the dice tonight if our stash has been disturbed. Also ask the dice if our quiver of arrows is infinite. There's a, more things that we could ask the dice, yes. You know what else would help the war effort? Braces. Braces that can send messages, just saying. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty, so uh, in terms of the money you have, you currently have uh, 10 gold piece worth of silver and 9 gold piece worth of gold and 10 gold piece worth of 
platinum. So you have 29 gold pieces of coins on you. And if you want the um, if you want the stashed stuff, you're gonna have to go up north and find your stash. So many people are against that arrows idea. It seems like it, yes. And 161 platinum, yes. We are literally jingling. <laughs> We're not obliged to pay everything for Briar. It's enough that we're trying and making a dent in it. Yes, you're, you're making a significant dent in it. Like 100 gold pieces worth of diamond is a lot of money. That's like 10 grand. And you're getting 10 grand worth of diamond. Is that right? 10 grand? 100 times 100? 10 grand, yeah. How many is the rest of the jewelry? Uh, you could sell the rest of the dwarven jewelry if you want, and you could probably get a decent chunk for that. I'm feeling like you're not making decisions. What do you, what do you want to do? What is the main focus of Apis's neurons? What are your synapses telling you? <laughs> Dance. <laughs> Undo the arrows thing. We're not selling. We didn't sell the arrows. We just we got them out and said like arrows, and the guy was like interesting. We don't care about gold. Just donate some arrows to the war effort anyway. All right. So we'll do that at the uh, at the meeting. Okay, so you just hang around for a half an hour or so. Then you come, uh, you come into the meeting, and you see that the uh, the lieutenant is there, Lieutenant Gillaby. You see that uh, Joey is there. Charlie has also been called. Um, the uh, there is a. I don't think you've met this person yet. You know what? I'm just going to use you because I had a name from from an NPC that we never actually worked out who they were meant to be. So I'm just going to use them. Ander. Uh, you see a high elf, uh, high elf called Ander, um, who is also in there. Introduces themselves as um, as as being a follower of um, uh, Flunchel, the goddess of healing. And you exposition dump 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 dump, dump, dump to them anything that you want to say. Uh, they tell you what you need to know as well. And once you've had your small talk and um, and and uh, sort of beginning the meeting. We jump into the scene, like deep into the meeting, deep in, well, well and truly into it. Um, you bring up the fact that you need a, a healing permit, and you say that you have um, that you've healed, uh, you have healing powers, and uh, and having some sort of a, uh, a permit to be allowed to heal without it being, uh, be, without you being arrested for practicing necromancy, um, that would be handy. Uh, Lieutenant Gellaby points to the uh, the high elf that you've just met, Ander, um, and Ander says, uh, "Yes, I um, I that's why I'm here. I've uh, I have the position where I can uh, allocate um, uh, the rights to heal. Normally, under ideal circumstances, I would um, under I, I would have you undergo some sort of a test, um, some sort of." proof to me that you can uh, that you can do as you say you can do and that you can uh, you are responsible enough to to have such a license um, under such circumstances uh, the, the the lieutenant has requested that I forego the usual um, protocol and issue you with a temporary license I have the paperwork here uh, sh they hand out um, some sheets of paper that uh, that have various things written on them uh, they ask for your signature you you are um, you are capable of writing and you say ah yes I, I can write she says uh, they say well uh, write uh, just sign your name at the bottom here you have a good read of it knowing full well stuff about Faye uh, because in one session you're going to give away your blood your name and sign a document that you're not reading um, <laughs> You read it; it's all very straightforward stuff. It's it's definitely not got anything in it that that strikes you as odd. It's just saying that you understand that um, this gives you the right to to heal people without um, without needing to uh, run it by anybody. Blah blah blah. At your discretion, you can heal people. You also understand. It's basically like there's some warning in there as well, saying like, uh, under I understand that healing people uh, in sight of other people often puts a target on your back as um, as able to heal without limitation and so people will, people are likely to come to you for uh, healing things that you cannot heal things like diseases or permanent uh, permanent defects or things like that they'll they'll people will want things from you once they realize you can uh, that you can heal um, and so this this license comes with a certain amount of responsibility blah 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 um, it also outlines the importance of 
discretion, like understanding that healing magic is a, limita a limited resource every day. Um, uh, and so healing like a minor cut to yourself in the morning is not as responsible a use of it uh, as he as waiting to see if there's somebody with a broken bone that needs healing later in the day but ultimately it comes down to your discretion it outlines that legally you can't be uh, you can't be challenged by uh, the courts of law or the the uh, courts of the king for for healing somebody for healing the wrong person like in a situation where you heal somebody who is less wounded that can't be held against you blah 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 it's basically a legal document. Nothing seems out of out of place. Uh, so you sign the bottom of it. Um, you also sign a separate piece, a separate thing that is different to the the first one, separate to the first one that outlines that this particular um, uh, license is considered a temporary one because you haven't gone into, uh, you haven't gone through the process of actually undergoing the the trial, uh, the the test, I suppose, um, to getting a permanent one. Uh, but you but but having this temporary one does not negate the ability to get the permanent one later if you want it so you sign that as well and sure enough uh, she makes a copy of that one folds it over and hands it to you so you have a piece of paper which i think i can now add to your inventory as well uh, if i remember which thing to click on this one here books and a letter maybe yeah there you go you have a letter that acts as your uh, temporary healing permit a provisional license uh, it's basically until the end of the war, Tree of Dave, in terms of how long it will last. It's like, while ever we're in a war situation, this is a temporary license to say that you can... You, you're on your P-plates, yes. Um, can we make an amendment to say something like we cannot be coerced into healing someone against our will? Uh, that is also included in the in the documents, Spates, that you... Uh, that you... you that you cannot... Uh, well, it doesn't say you cannot heal someone against your will because you could, like you, you could be tried, you could uh, essentially be forced to do so, uh, but you cannot be held responsible for healing someone against your will, like if you heal some bad guy who goes on to commit um, commit some sort of offence after you've healed them, uh, you can't be held responsible for that. That's that's also in the document. Once this war is over, I'd appreciate this opportunity to make the license permanent. And Ander says, um, absolutely, I, uh, come and speak to me after after the war is over, um, uh, or in times of uh, in a time of ceasefire at the very least, and we'll we'll undergo the uh, the appropriate trial. All right, you've got your P license essentially. You've got your heal license. Um, you get your uh, your you've you've asked for a rapier, and someone has brought you a rapier. Uh, you can add that to your inventory as well. I don't believe I have. A rapier um, symbol for you? Do I under weapons? Do we have rapier? We do not. Uh, we don't have rapier yet, so I guess we'll add that to the uh, the document, and we'll we'll uh, we will add. I don't think I've got a rapier, have I? We've just got swords. So we'll add a rapier onto the um, the document as well. Uh, which is a weapon that you can now add. Oh, and it'll mean changing it on the battle map page as well as well, won't it? Yeah. Instead of we'll we'll drop longsword and put rapier in instead because instead of a plus four, it will be it'll be a plus six to attack. So you'll be able to do some more damage. So you swap your longsword for a rapier. Um, that's done easily enough. Um, holy water. As for holy water, Ander, Ander exclaims that they they have a very limited amount of holy water. This is the entirety of Fondurg's uh, supply of holy water. Um, uh, um, this is the entirety of Fondurg's supply of holy water, uh, and they give you the potions. Let's go with. If I go with, let's just go with blue. So we've got regular pure water and uh, and holy water and she gives you uh, essentially what would it be how much does she have a liter of holy water i think that's a good amount she gives you a liter of holy water and says this is fondog's entire entire supply and she is working on or they are working on more uh, holy water for fondog but it is a, is a costly uh, endeavor um, and it is a time consuming endeavor as well and so there will be more to come but at the moment this is all that they have uh is there anything else you need from this meeting to colonel bluster i've gathered the team i need here in fondurg have you made further preparations for the mission yes uh so you mentioned this to lieutenant um uh, Gellaby. 
I've got my team together. Uh, Joey's going to come with me. Charlie's going to come with me. Um, have you got any more preparations uh, for the for the mission as well? And Colonel Bluster, <laughs> Lieutenant Gellaby, says, um, uh, "Yes, I, I um, not quite as wet as that. He's not um, he's not Sir Conrad. He says, "Oh uh, yes, I I've uh, I've prepared a a cart to take you north. Uh, it's a supply wagon." I've arranged for you to be the mercenaries uh, in charge of protecting the wagon. Uh, I've also sent message, sent missive uh, up to uh, Sergeant May, I think his name is. Let me double check that. Check my Shadridge notes, which are down here somewhere. NPCs of Shadridge. Sergeant Jim Mason. I've sent, uh, I've sent missive up to Sergeant Jim Mason, uh, who will be your contact in Shadridge. He, he, he's, he direct, he's my direct uh, report in Shadridge, and uh, and he controls uh, a couple of battalions of um, of, of of military uh, on the Shadridge front. So he tells you that is happening. Uh, anything else that he's prepared? He's also on the supply wagon that he's sending you with. Is some rations and stuff for you. You have um, you have uh, a supply of however many rations you want, and torches and water skins and all that all that stuff that we're going to hand wave like he's giving you that stuff a tent yeah he's giving you a tent as well um if you need it what's the um what's the standing order in regards to procuring health potions uh they say uh unfortunately the health potions that we have uh, we have are all have all been allocated already um the the town of shadridge is uh creating health potions as fast as they can but many of them are getting used as fast as they can uh, faster than they can procure them so really, it's uh, it's down to the sergeant uh, on duty. It's down to Jim Mason as to decide who gets which health potions and when, in which uh, in order of priority. So the stash, the supply of health potions of Fondog has been used up. Um, health potions of Shadridge are being created. Um, somebody, some alchemist maybe, in Shadridge, is creating health potions. Um, but they are being used faster than they can make them. You make sure these mercenaries have been properly checked. It says they've been moonshined this morning. Some authorization for the hobgoblins to show? What do you mean by that? We need to mention that we've got a couple of our own errands to run before we leave. He says, you leave in your own time. It's uh, This is a private mission. Um, you, report to, you report to us, but you are not technically military, so we cannot give you orders. It seems He seems to bustle at that, uh, bristle, bustle at that, as if like that. He wishes he could order everybody around, but technically he understands that anybody who's not officially part of the military, he doesn't have as much authority to uh, to demand. So it's really up to you when you leave. Do you want to try and catch Smackleworm after the meeting, get a copy of that report that Bluster glossed over? Could do if you want. Thank God he's Jim Mason, not Jim Junkie. <laughs> Get one blast of this keto diet approved drink. <laughs> Shouting at you like a um, a drill sergeant. Uh, something that shows the hobgoblins that we recognised as allies. Oh, I see. Um, he he says there, there's no doubt of that. If you if you're uh, met by the hobgoblins, uh, anything that you could be wearing could be replicated by um, by the demons anyway, and so they'll have to go and undergo their own uh, have to undergo their own checks to see that you're. Uh, you're safe. As far as allies go, anything anything that's not a demon is an ally these days. All right, let's head back and collect that dust. Is our bank between Fondog and Shadridge? No, it's north of Shadridge. You'd have to go into Shadridge and through Shadridge into the war front to get to the um, to get to your bank. Your bank is your your river bank is uh, literally hidden in the woods that is now the frontier of the war. Which I'm sure is fine. I'm sure, I'm sure it's perfectly fine. All right, anything else from the meeting before you move on from the meeting, everybody? You're going to, after the meeting, you're going to go get your diamond dust, go get healed of your mycanid ability. Have you considered the termite folk as potential allies? He says, I'm, they're, they're, they're not exactly intelligent beings. Seems like he has dismissed the termite folk as possibles. What time is it, noonish? Uh, yeah, it's about noonish at the, by this point. Uh, about 11, let's say. 11am. 
Where was the necromancer? He was down here. He was not up, where, up anywhere near Shadridge. He was west of here in the Lannis Woods. You were a bloody ass, Robert. <laughs> All right, tell Joey where to meet us. So we'll uh, we'll go we'll go collect everybody that we need, all the things that we're doing, and meet us at the north end of town in about an hour's time. Um, you are going to head to a jeweler now. You head to a second a, se a separate secondary jeweler, um, another rock gnome gentleman, and he uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. Do you want to sell the remainder of your dwarven jewelry to uh, to make the money needed for all of the remainder? The remaining diamond dust. All right, overwhelming. Yes, you are going to sell the remainder of your your jewelry. So you get it appraised first. I'm going to delete that now. So no more dwarven jewelry in your quiver, uh, and we'll see how much it was worth. Um, altogether, altogether, it would be worth sixty-two gold. He's willing to give you. He does a little appraisal for it. Um, he, he's willing to give you sixty-two gold for the lot. We'll take the lot. Do you want to just take the money first? Add in the 62, that would be smart. We'll just go 62 gold onto 9 is 71. So you have 71 gold in your pocket. You sell all that all, all that jewellery. And then you ask about diamond dust. He does, as Spates suggested way earlier, he does, you know, work with um, with with diamond and like shaping it, of cutting it from um, from raw diamond into cut diamond, and so he does have diamond dust. So he potters away into the back room. Let's see how much he actually comes back with. How much does he have? Uh... <laughs> Not a lot. <laughs> he comes back. He comes back with. Uh, th I'll, I'll, I'll be kind and double that. Um, I rolled double O two, so he comes back with four gold pieces worth of diamond dust. He says, "I, uh, uh, it's, it seems somebody came in uh, just just a couple of days ago and uh, and cleared me out of my diamond dust. Um, one of the PEA lot have been uh, have been taking taking some of the diamond dust. Um, apparently, in as um, uh, as as Polython was saying to you, she has been trying to help, uh, trying to help Briar." A couple of times um she's been trying to help briar for a while now but polython has already been into town and 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 taken this guy's diamond dust to try and use in previous uh, attempts at helping briar it seems <laughs> fine buy it i guess all right so we're gonna uh, i'm gonna say we'll buy it with silver so that we've got less jangly jenglies and we'll go down to 68 we we'll buy the four gold pieces worth of diamond dust from that guy and then you head back to the previous one as well. So she gave you 36. Uh, with that four gold, we've got 40, 40 diamond dust and you give 108 gold to her to, uh, to, to do as well. You head back to Sparkly's, uh, Sparkle's Sparkly's um, and you meet with Gretchen. That was her name, wasn't it? Gretchen, yeah. Uh, we go back to Gretchen and you, uh, you tring into the shop. It's been about two and a half hours, nearly three hours. Uh, she sees you, she, she hears you coming in and pops her head out of the back room. Oh, yeah, I'll just be right there. Almost done. And you hear like a drill. And she's like got some sort of a, um, a mechanical machine, which is remarkable for this uh, age, except for the fact that uh, gnomes are very much tinkerers. Uh, and so she's she's probably got some sort of arcane powered tinkering device that essentially works as an electric drill, and she's 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 dusting this uh, this diamond down, trying her best not to lose any of it. Um, you're only waiting about ten more minutes in her shop before she um, before she comes. It works with a foot pedal, yeah. Uh, she comes out with bag of dust, like a big old bag, put, pops it on the weighing scales, and um, uh, and and it weighs the same. Uh, a little bit less than uh, what you gave her. Uh, not enough to be like, she's trying to dupe me. Enough to be like, there's some amount of dust that's not going to be able to be caught. Obviously, she's like, it's, it's more fine than she could catch. And so she, some amount of it has, has been lost. What kind of jewelry does she specialize in? Rings, necklaces, tiaras? A little bit of everything, uh, mostly necklaces. But a little bit of everything. Um, all right, so she is going to hand you a hundred and I'm going to say a hundred and five gold pieces worth because she's lost a little bit in the process. Uh, so a hundred and you've got a hundred and forty-five gold pieces worth of diamond dust. And to not spend too much longer on this, uh, you thank her, you pay the rem remainder of whatever you uh, were going to pay her, 
Um, I hope she wore a mask. She's got diamonds in her lungs now. If she hasn't worn a mask, she can just get one of the clerics to cure her later, right? <laughs> wow, almost no different in weight at all. Thank you. Appreciate your hard work. <laughs> She's very thankful. She hands over the dust. Thank you for your uh, for your for your uh, patronage. Any magical jewelry in the shop? Uh, sh mm, probably not, but I'll roll a percentile ch check for it. Um, all right, let me see. Uh, I'll give it a. There's a ten percent chance that she has some magical jewelry. Uh, I got a sixty-three, so no, she does not have magical jewelry. Wraith wants to get to Shadridge so much. Stop fucking around. <laughs> you take the diamond dust. Uh, you say thanks. You leave her store without the other part of her personality triggering, thankfully. Uh, you head back to Polython, and as you get to the PEA and the greenhouse, you see that uh, in the greenhouse, working with Polython, is Briar. Briar has arrived by this point uh, to start her day. Um, she's chatting with her back to you as you enter, and you have 145 diamond dust worth, uh, 145 gold piece worth of diamond dust to uh, de myconid yourself. What do you want to do? Let's get a rapier. <laughs> you have a rapier, Avis. That has already been account accomplished. You have a rapier, and uh, in and it has replaced your longsword. Walk right up and see. Right, we're ready. I've had a very productive morning, Polython. You pop a little pouch of uh, of diamond dust on on the desk and say, well, "Let's get to it." Briar, good morning. How are you? Briar sort of looks up and looks down again. Uh, in the brief moment that she looks up to see you. I'm just going to have an, uh, a perception check from you. Uh, that is a 13 plus your perception. Perception is a plus 2 from wisdom, taking it to a 15, plus another 3 from your proficiency in it, taking you to an 18. You do not get forest bonus. Um, with an 18 perception, however, you don't need forest bonus because as she looks up and looks down at you, you see that on her face, starting from about the center of her forehead, is a very, uh, a very prominent scar, a very deep scar that looks like uh, a like a the scar, type of scar you get from a burn. Um, it looks like a, a very white uh, stretched skin, um, much like you know if you've ever burnt your finger on a hot pan or something, and then a couple of days later the entirety of that part of the skin is kind of like one one single chunk that you can like press in on one side and the whole part moves all together. It's all been it's like the skin cells have been soldered together. Uh, it starts in the center of her forehead, heads down over her eye. Her, her uh, left eyebrow is pretty much entirely gone. Her eye is kind of sw uh, like s swollen shut by this um, uh, by this scar, and it goes down over her cheek. And you, that's as far as, as much of it as you caught, caught before she sort of looked down again. What did you do to her, Wraith? What did you do to her? What are the requirements for health potions again? Are there any ingredients in the greenhouse? There are ingredients in the greenhouse. Polython, Polython is working on it. That's part of what the PEA is doing for the war effort, is trying to make potions. They are growing the... Um, growing the... Um, Flonum berries. Don't stare, don't stare, don't stare. Good thing we got the healing permit. Yep. Briar? Not going to say hello? And she goes, Oh, uh, no, uh, sorry, hello. How are you, Apis? It's, it's good. good to see you again. Just has her head down as she talks. In she's got she was raised by gnomes. So she's got an Irish accent. It's nice to see you again, Avis. I'm glad you're well. I um I should be going to I should be going to town. Um, Palathan, they they might need me for uh, the moon the moonlight stuff. Can we take some ingredients to Edith or as an excuse to see Edith, please? Um, you ask that of Palathan. You're like, is there any chance that uh, I'll, I'll be heading up to um, Edith in Shadridge, the uh, apothecarist? Um, is there any chance that I can take any ingredients for, for her potions and things? And Polython says, we've been sending them uh, with supply carts uh, for several months now, so we've we've spared all that we can spare, and every time that we grow more, or cultivate more, we send it uh, with due haste. So Edith has got, if it is, I don't think Edith was the name I was given, but whoever the apothecarist up there... Um, they, uh, they, they, they have the ingredients needed. How, um, how much more diamond dust would you need for a second casting, Polython? She says, uh, you, you explain how much you got, and she says, about a third as much again, i.e. 200 gold. Two, you need 100 for each time you cast it. It's a pleasure to be back in your company, Briar. It's been, um, 
I've, uh, I've missed having you around. And she goes, yeah. What's our relationship with Brian? Uh, mainly just friends. Like, you've only known her a couple of weeks, but she was a very useful uh, druid. Tiny, tiny little lady. She was She's a uh, hobbit uh, raised by gnomes, and she's only two foot tall, which is even short, even for a hobbit. Um, she's incredibly small, but, like, makes up for it by being quite a powerful druid. She she has a point to prove, um, to show and show people that it's, it's not about your size, it's about your connection to nature, and nature's much bigger than all of us, and blah blah blah. And so she's that kind of a person, and uh, you get along well with her, or at least you did before, before you disappeared. Hive mind, what was the apprentice apothecary's name? Toria. We spent like three days with her. <laughs> It's been. It was a little more than that. You spent a couple of days with her, and then you got kidnapped together by um, by a dragon. And going through an ordeal like that can be quite uh, quite intensive. And then she escaped from the dragon, and you didn't. And then you saw her again for a couple of days after after you escaped. Uh, after you managed to uh, put the dragon down. And then, as far as she's concerned, she spent the next eight months off and on seeing you around, helping you out in the. Um, excursions to the north, the war efforts and stuff. But you don't know her all that well. <clears throat> Is it, um, was the name Toria running in the shop in Shadridge? And she goes, ah yes, Toria, that was it. Right, um, well, shall we get started then, Apis? And Paul, uh, and Briar sort of perks up and says, what, 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 what are you doing? He says, um, Apis has got some uh, interesting out of alignment uh, body, mind, soul and whole um, oh what's happened uh, Briar looks up at you almost forgetting to hide her face like her concern for you coming shining through at this point you see more of the scar it's, it's not only a thin point on the forehead that expands down over the eye but it continues around in a crescent shape and across her, it cuts across her uh, her left side of her mouth, which kind of gives her like a, um, uh, a, a, a droopy kind of side of the mouth, uh, and it and it points to a pi a point on her chin, and at that point you realise it's a perfect crescent moon, that is a scar all across all across the left side of her face. Um, does her eye work? Her eye seems to maybe work, but it's like it's it's almost um, scarred shut. Like she can look out of it if she looks up like this, and she can see out of her left eye. Otherwise, she just uses her right. She goes, "What's happened?" And you say, "Oh, um, I made a deal with some myconids, some mushroom people." And she goes, "Oh, myconids! I haven't seen myconids in ages." She seems to perk up a little bit, and uh, and, she, and and she goes, "I haven't seen myconids in ages. They're lovely people, aren't they?" And you say, "They are lovely people." Um, I made a deal with them to fix my memory and they made me part mushroom and it's and she goes what uh, yeah um you explain the situation blah 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 you 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 kind of notice like oh there's some there's some ground here that like we can just talk like friends again you do notice that she does kind of try and keep her face hidden and she does naturally kind of bring her hand up to um to sort of like just be over her face for a lot of talking she finds excuses to like put her elbow on things so that she can kind of rest her head in it or she puts she she's wearing her hood up the whole time as well and kind of keeping her hood to the sides so she's very self-conscious of this this huge scar across her face now um but you tell her the interesting story it's uh it, it, it's it's nice to like have a moment of uh Normality, I guess, with her again. Forgot my time with the Feywilds, blah, blah, blah. Uh, process, yada, yada, and part Machinid now. And she goes, oh, wow, that's fascinating. Um, uh, and Paul and says, not for long, though, hopefully. Um, Apis, come into my uh, into my office. I'll uh, I'll perform the ritual in there. And um, and Briya says, actually, let's see. Yeah, Briya says, oh, is this, um, is this the restoration? And and person says, uh, yes, I'm going to realign Apis's body, soul, mind, and whole. And she says, ah, uh, okay. I'm gonna have you roll an insight check. With a fifteen plus two insight, you get the impression that uh, that Briar was a little jealous of that, perhaps. That ah uh, shit, you're gonna get fixed up, and I'm not. But she doesn't say anything. 
there's um there's more diamond dust uh, for you as well i've been trying to acquire as much as i can so that you can also get this process done to you i would recommend you go first but i'm heading out to tackle a demon portal today and Briar's like interrupting you before you even get that far and going no 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 you 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 take it you you definitely need it more than i do at this stage i can i'm i'm still able to do what i can do for them for the most part um with that 17 insight i'll just carry it over she kind of trails off when she's saying you do you you need it more than i do because i'm still i'm still at full strength like i can still do what i'm doing she real she she trails off because you you intuit from that that she there is something she can't do that she's not at full strength but she is kind of just dismissing it like it's not important like she's definitely not at full strength um there's a there's a uh, squash. There's a fair bit extra diamond dust from what I gathered this morning. It might be close to enough to help you out. You can, you can definitely keep keep asking the the uh, jewelers of town. They 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 create diamonds. Uh, you know, they create diamond dust whenever they're cutting diamonds. So like I'm sure they'll they'll acquire more, and we can certainly try it on you. I also have the goal to buy the rest. It just needs to be ground down, and we need to wait until they've found enough diamonds and things. And Briar's like. She kind of blushes a little and puts her head down and says, you're, you're very kind, Apis. Thank you. You head after Polython into the uh, office behind her. She uh, takes a little time to quick, quickly just like um, uh, take all of the things off of her desk. She's got papers. She's got bottles of ink and stuff. She's got a, a, um, a couple of like house plants, the potter plants that are on her desk. She takes all of that stuff to leave to leave the desk like a surgical table essentially for you. Um, she takes all of that stuff off, take, puts it all on the ground or in drawers and things, and then gestures for you to get up onto the desk. Apis, you uh, you you um, you lie down uh, voluntarily on the desk uh, uh, of Polython's office, and uh, Polython says, "Briar, if you wouldn't mind, I would appreciate your uh, assistance in this ritual." Um, Briar says, "Of course, of course," and closes the door. Uh, steps into the office, and uh, Polython hands Briar the the bag of uh, diamond dust. Uh, she measures out how much she needs, which is about two thirds of what you've given her. Measures it out and uh, and and holds that in a, in a pouch of its own. And then they start to perform the ritual of greater restoration. Uh, in my games, healing magic isn't generally as much like cure wounds and stuff works as written, but greater restoration and some of the more intense re uh, restorative things particularly like revivification magics bringing you back to life and stuff they tend to not just be just cast it and it's fine uh, because I think that takes away some of the drama and some of the excitement of of the dangers that come from from things happening to you especially like removing cur curses and stuff so it's more of a ritual than an action to cast so she begins the ritual um, she is chanting certain words that need to be said uh, in languages that you don't understand in like old ancient elvish and ancient draconic words come in put in her stuff as well uh, she's also lit uh, lighting a few candles on the way she's like it's very almost cultish uh, the way that she's like chanting this thing over and over and lighting these these candles around you and she's placing these candles around um the air seems to start getting heavy and being that it's it's winter even inside of a greenhouse it's a little bit chilly in the air but it starts to get warm it starts to feel comfortable it starts to feel like you're getting into a bath not from the wetness but from the comfort and the warmth that sort of seeps up from the bottom of you from where the table is right right through your back as if like the room is filling with water just slowly nice and warm water until eventually you're kind of just floating in it it feels you can feel the warmth kind of uh, come over the entire body um, but as I say it doesn't feel like actual water it just it, you're, not, you're not drowning or anything it's just the warmth and comfort of the the room starting to fill with uh, appropriate divine magics she's she's um, she's setting the scene for the ritual essentially she asks you to during this process think about who you are as a person who you have always been as a person who you want to be as a person. She explains between chants, between lighting candles, she explains the ne necessity of the four elements of a person. The body, the soul, the mind, and the whole. 
the body being the physical, tangible body, the flesh and blood and bone, the soul being the the soul, the the, the spirit of the person, the mind being your uh, your intelligence and your mind, your your creativity, your thinking, and your whole with an with a W, being the connection between all three of those things. They, they used to believe that, uh, that the body was, it was just three elements of a person, the body, the soul, and the mind. But they realized that in things like um, wear curses, you, your body can be out of whack by being cursed to transform into a werewolf, but your mind and your soul are still intact. And so they didn't know how to fix those things. If, they, if you still have a body, it's just a different body. Or... For instance, undead. Undead creatures, zombies and things are often the body and uh, the soul, maybe, depending on the undead, uh, but usually not the mind. Likewise, vampires and things are often the, the, the mind and the body, but they, don't, they no longer have the soul. So they're, 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 they were out of alignment until they realized, uh, they realized from further study that there is a fourth element that also needs to be in alignment, the, the whole being essentially the the soup in which those three uh, float, the connections between them. And as she's describing these things, Apis, you open your you open your eyes and you're in a dark void. You're in you're still in that comforting uh, warmth and you still kind of feel the warmth of the glow, the, the the almost light coming from the glow of the candles in the room. They sit the incense that she was burning. You can smell that still. But you are you are now just floating in a void. And you can see, looking down at yourself, that you are three in one. You have you have split yourself into these three elements. From the camera's perspective, as it were, from the audience of this story's perspective, you can see Apis in third person, just this, these three elements of Apis floating. There is the body, and you can tell, tell from the body that there is nothing going on behind the eyes. It's just like... Uh, I don't want to say a corpse because that in, that indicates like negative emotions and things. It's a it's a very much a lifeless body, like more like a, a waxwork doll of Apis is what it looks like. There is a waxwork doll of Apis, and then just to its right, you see sort of an Apis outline that has no physical uh, form to it. There is there is no way you could draw a line between what is and is not part of that creature. But looking at it, it looks like a perfect. Um, a perfect slider of opacity to translucence of the surrounding void to what is definitively the ghost of Apis, essentially. And on the right, on the uh, left, on the other side of the uh, the body, is this network of this network of uh, of light. This 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 almost like a um, you, it's almost like you can't see it. It's a it's a web of gossamer web. It's essentially. Uh, if you've seen diagrams of the nervous system um, before, there is like a connection of this 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 weave in the where the brain of Apis would be, where the head of the Apis would be, uh, and there's exactly it's you, yeah, it's exactly how, however many <laughs> however many connections uh, there are in chat right now. Uh, it's that many um, weaves in the in Apis's head, and then it's it's be you're ba barely able to see it at all until one of them fires, and then it shoots like this. Uh, this 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 uh, this be tiny little note of light uh, down through its through its accompanying body parts, and you can see the mind of Apis, the 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 intelligence of Apis. What's more is when you look closer, we can see that between those three elements, there are connections. It's like a uh, it's much more like geometric shapes very straight lines very ang very specific angles between all three parts of you that are connecting these three elements of apis together finally what you notice in this void is that the body has fungus elements to it far more fungus elements than we are seeing in apis in the last few weeks it looks about like one in every four parts of this body are incredibly myconid in appearance. So Apis's waxwork doll sort of uh, body is growing fungus from it and turning into fungus on parts of its arms. And you can see that from those parts, the parts of Apis's body that are fungus, 
the geometric shapes around it are broken. They are not as straight. They are not well connected. They are they've got they've got disconnected parts to them. The lines that just kind of end before reaching the soul or the the, the mind, they're not connected to the rest. At this point, from the from the outside of this ritual, not that Apis sees this, but we're seeing some dramatic irony here for the sake of the scene. Uh, at a certain point, Pawthon gives the nod to to Briar, and she starts to bring out the diamond dust and uh, and sort of throw it into the air around you. And as it as it sort of floats above Apis's body, it it hangs in the air like dust in a uh, a ray of light. And then the diamond dust starts to appear in your void where you're where Apis is experiencing things, and you look down to see the diamond dust shoot over to the parts of the body that are um, that are fungus. You start to see the diamond dust just landing in strategic places where you were, where before you were seeing small pinpricks of a void just through your body. The areas where these geometric shapes that are com that are connecting your pieces together, where they were broken, you see the the diamonds. Uh, the diamond dust seems to uh, to align itself into areas where they should be, and it encourages these these geometric shapes to click back into place in the places that they should be. As the diamond dust itself is the glue that uh, that realigns the pieces of your body, your your uh, your three parts start to swirl around one another, and move back closer and closer and closer together like diamond stem cells repairing broken bo bones. As they realign themselves, you see all of these three, uh, all of these three parts coming towards one another again. And then Polython needs to roll a check to see if she can succeed on this ritual. Because unfortunately, <laughs> with it being a ritual, there is a success and failure chance. Uh, I will. T I'll roll in. Even though it's an NPC rolling, I will tell you what the DC is going to be. Uh, for this, for the number of days that you have had it now, because the longer you have had disalignment in your body, mind, soul, and whole, um, there is an increasing DC for getting rid of it. Uh, so let's see. Where are you now? You have had it since Sintabrun. My canids, there it is. Okay, so you've had it for one, two, three. So there's a DC. Uh, I've got it somewhere, don't I? DC of it for three weeks. And I'll be able to look that up. I think I can just remember. It's one per week, isn't it? So one, two, three. DC of eight. So it's 11. Okay. Uh, with Polython's with Polython's modifier, uh, let's just control F Polython. Where are you? Uh, that's you. Where's her stats though? There she is. Uh, which means that she needs a. Oh, that's good. She needs a three or she needs a three or more on the dice to succeed on this. So I am going to. Um, I am going to use the. The dice come here, she needs a three or more on the dice, and if she fails, if she gets a two or a one, we'll, at that point, we'll see if we can hear a point that. Ten! All right, ten on the dice from Polython. This is a success. She is, thankfully, a very powerful druid. She's a very high-level druid, um, and so she is, she has a high enough modifier. She, she knows this spell well enough that she can uh, she can succeed on the on the casting of it. Uh, plus, the benefit is the uh, the spell the, the the effect that you had hadn't actually been on you for all that long in the grand scheme of things. <clears throat> Something like uh, the wear curse, the 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 uh, Mosher's wear curse, for instance. He's had it he had it for about nine months before he met you, I think, and now another eight months on top of that. So casting something like this on him could could realign his three parts as well, his four parts. Um, but the DC of it would be much higher because he's had the um, he's had the the curse for a lot longer. Briar has only been sick for about two weeks. She's only had this this uh, crescent moon scar on her face for about two weeks. 
Uh, so the DC for Briar would not necessarily be be high because of time, but there are other factors involved in what is happening with Briar that could could add to the DC of uh, of her check. Meanwhile, back in Apis's body, though, these four parts come together. The geometric shapes seem to surround you once all all three parts come back in as one, and then the, as soon as they do, there's like a an, a, a tangible uh, click as everything goes back into place the way that it should have been all along, the way that it was destined to be. And then the light starts to come back to the room, the temperature starts to drop back to the chilly sort of uh, midwinter temperature that it was. You see the candles all <laughs> extinguish themselves as, the, uh, as the, the ritual was a success. And Apis, you are cured of your Myconid abilities. And as you get yourself together, to thank Polython for the uh, for the journey and uh, for the, for this incredible experience, uh, as you get you together, Charlie and Joey, to head north towards Shadridge. That's where we're going to leave it, and we're going to pick up here next time. Thank you very much. See you next time. Hey, did you know I also have a Robert Hartley GM podcast now? Yeah, if uh, if if YouTube is a bit much on the old bandwidth, you can go and check out the podcast in the links below.